It's always good to get an endorsement from Frank Turek. He's been a big fan of mine for many years. Frank, if you're listening, like you, man. Didn't say love you, I said like you. Myron. Oh, look at this. See, this is green. And so then it's going right through to the blue. Isn't that amazing technology, green screens and all that stuff? Welcome, if you're new here. I'm the type of person that uh, a lot of apologists don't like. They uh, don't want to affirm my existence. They don't want to fill that gaping hole I have in my heart by acknowledging my existence. In fact, they'll say things like, uh, stop listening to that. Why, why isn't this working, Myron? Yeah, he's supposed to be talking right now. Tell you, Myron's paid $5 an hour and he's overpaid. Okay, I, um, before I take calls, I asked uh, long ago, it feels like it's long ago, I asked questions of uh, during a live stream. And uh, I think they were good ones. You guys can be the judge. And, uh, but they didn't answer it during the live stream and said they answered it just yesterday. And so I'm showing this now because, uh, because uh, I, I love the attention that I'm getting when they mention my name. That and plus I do think really it's a good question. And I, and I want to show and maybe help people like Tim Stratton, which is this guy down here, why people disagree with him, not just atheists, uh, some theists disagree with him on, uh, on his answer. Okay, I think it's ready to go. Let's jump to Pine Creek. So Pine Creek, um, one of the more, not I, I don't want to say famous, but one of the more well-known atheists was on <laughs> the, uh, in the chat in the uh, discussion that Tim had with Chris. And he asked this question. He says this, did God create me knowing with certainty that I would reject him if it's true, I die a non-Christian. How is that different than causing me to hold false beliefs? Okay, if you're a Christian listening, how would you answer that question before you hear Tim Stratton's answer? If God created me, knowing with 100% certainty that I will freely choose to reject him, how is that different than God causing me to reject him? Go ahead. Well, yeah, so first of all, uh, he's going to be happy that you mentioned that he was one of the most famous uh, atheists because <laughs> More it was about well a year known. <laughs> Yeah, well, because it was about a year ago, I first had some interaction with him, and I didn't know who he was. And I was basically like, I don't know who you are. And he, yeah, that's true. Uh, about a year ago, he we interacted a little bit, and he said he didn't know who I was. And a, a year ago, Tim, I was actually very close to accepting Jesus into my heart. And then you did that to me. And I said, no way. If I'm not getting love from Christ's servants, then I'm, I'm out. So you're the reason, Tim, I'm still an atheist today. I was so close and then you rejected me. I cried and cried in my room for hours and hours. I did feel better afterwards. I, kinda, I think I got Can I tell feeling. a secret? Can I tell a secret real quick? I had what? no idea who he was before. So David was like, uh, hey, he's more well known atheist. I was like, oh, okay, cool. Yeah. I have I since come to learn that he is well known and he's got a pretty uh pretty good YouTube channel and stuff yeah. like that. So he asks good questions. So yeah, mm -hmm. did God yes, did God create me knowing with certainty that I would reject him? If it's true that he dies as a non-Christian, then he asks, how is that different than causing me to hold false beliefs? And so I would just say it, it comes down to necessity and that necessity is the difference maker. And moreover, as an example, I regularly use, I think most people can see the difference. Let's bring the Avenger. I know I'm wearing a DC shirt today, but let's bring the Marvel comics and the Avengers back in. Okay, let's, hey, let's give them a chance. I know some of you atheists are skeptical. And some Christians are skeptical of, well, how does the word necessity make a difference? Just give them a chance. I think most people can see the difference between Hydra and the Avengers movies causally determining and thus necessitating Bucky to think one way instead of the other. And then Dr. Strange uh, on the other 
side of the coin, uh, actualizing a possible world in which he knew how Thanos would freely think, uh, even though he didn't have to. Now, the former seems evil. The latter, uh, the Doctor Strange analogy, seems praiseworthy, at least to millions upon millions of moviegoers. That's because millions upon millions of moviegoers are stupid. They don't think about these things. <laughs> Okay, I'm not a huge Avengers fan, so I'm kind of... Is Hydra the organization that made uh, Captain America and Bucky? Is that right? Like, they're just a bunch of men, an organization that, that did stuff? So they're not omniscient. They don't see the future? Okay. Now, Dr. Strangelove, he sees the future, right? Is that true? Okay. If that's true... If Dr. Strangelove can see the future with certainty and actualize a world where heinous things happen, then Dr. and he had free will to do otherwise, Dr. Strangelove should not be loved. He's an evil, evil man. If you think about it. Right? If Dr. Strangelove actualizes a world that he knows with 100% certainty that will lead to someone's rape. And he could have chosen a different world where there's no rape, but he didn't. That makes Dr. Strangelove a bad, bad guy. Is it Strangelove? Is that his name? What's his name? The, the time guy in Marvel. This is Strangelove, right? Yeah. Now, for Christians listening like Tim Stratton, where am I wrong here? And that's exactly why these millions of moviegoers... Well, Doctor Strange, right. The love part's not in there, right? Uh, into it that Hydra is evil and Doctor Strange is a yeah, hero sorry. who should no be love. praised. No love. So let me rephrase his question for clarity. Let me look at his question here. We could say, did God create me knowing with certainty that I would freely choose to reject him, even though I was not determined, necessitated, or forced to. Mm -hmm. And then he says, how is that different from causing me to hold false beliefs? And so I would say, well, but here's the problem, Tim. If God knows the future on our timeline, and he's never wrong about it, and he actualizes, he creates this world, then it's necessarily going to be the case, it's determined to be the case, that I will reject him if I die a non-believer. I think what would help is, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to draw a picture here to make this clear. Because we all like visuals, right? I mean, I could have been a youth pastor in a former life. I mean, I'm just, you take a red marker, okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, this is good. Mm -hmm. A little bit like that. Yep. Okay. That works. Okay, I think this is good. Are you paying attention, class? Okay, so you start with God. You start with God here, and he creates me. Ooh. See, I'm smiling, have no hair. See, that's me. There, and there's my free will. I can ooh, accept Jesus, or I can reject Jesus. That's all my free will. It's all on me, right? But now, let's say God didn't create me. What happens? This is what happens. If God doesn't create me, none of that happens. If God doesn't create me, I don't accept nor reject. 
everyone who's in heaven today is in heaven because God created them. And likewise, anybody who's in hell is in hell because God created them. That's just science. That's just simple, simple math. So if God creates me knowing with 100% certainty that I will reject him, how is that not causing me to go to hell? Just, just, just read the paper. God still exists, but everything else is crossed off if he doesn't create me. And keep in mind, God is before me. He existed before me. My thoughts don't exist. My choices don't exist until after he creates me. Molinism does not help you because God has actualized a world which he knew with 100% certainty what would happen. And he said, I'm okay with it. Dr. Strange is evil if he actualizes a world where he knows certain bad things will happen, he's evil for those bad things if he could have stopped it by not actualizing it. This whole free will thing in the middle is just an extra step added to make you feel good. Because this is what, the, let me draw out the Calvinist version. That's wrong. Hey, I'm doing this on the fly. It's live. There we go. This is the Calvinist version. God creates me knowing with 100% certainty that I'll go to hell. The only thing different between the Calvinists and the Molinists or the non-Calvinists is they put, this, they put this little branch in here to make it, oh, everything's okay. It's everything's okay. You got free will. Everything's okay. No, not everything's okay. Because this God has omniscience. Free will. Could have done otherwise. Actualizes, actualizes a world in which some people go to hell. That's a problem for you guys. Big, big problem. Even for the Calvinists, they just basically say, uh, Shut up, fool! Shut up, fool, and take it. Whereas the Molinists, the non Calvinists say, Oh, no, but you got, God knew what you would choose. He didn't know what you will choose. He knew what you would, but he actually. In fact, I remember bringing up this with uh, James White. Let's see if I can find it. Um. My guess says I won't find it. Boy, it was good too. It was so good. James White was on a live stream and I based on this topic and I asked a question about people like Tim Stratton. And uh, James White's response was, Doug's right. Essentially, there's no difference between the Calvinist and the Molinist or the non-Calvinist. Because God actualizes the world with, that he knew with 100% certainty what would happen. So what you, what you would do in certain circumstances is all baloney. And I can't find it. Maybe someone else in the live stream chat can find it. But does this make sense to Christians? Like, just throwing the word necessity, God doesn't, he's not the direct cause. Like, Tim Stratton says, well, because of this, everything's okay, the, the branch, that you, you have free will. No, because God knew which part of the branch would be chosen and still created me. So essentially, it's this. Because he knew. 
and God's never wrong. And God existed before your choices existed. Unless you think my choices are eternal past, coinciding with the eternal God, do you really want to go there? That I'm, somehow my choices have uh, thwarted the infinite regress? Yes. yes. I believe that God <laughs> created a non-deterministic, freedom-permitting world in which he knew how Pine Creek would freely choose. If he knew how I would choose, then I could not do otherwise. Otherwise, God is wrong. If God knew what I would choose, then I could not have chosen otherwise. And Christians, I know you're tempted right now to say, but, but you could have chosen otherwise and God just would have known that. You, would have to, you have to have some type of weird view of time in order to make that work. That time can go backwards and forwards or whatever. But in our world, time is linear. We got past, present, and future. So whatever happens in the future, if God knows it with certainty, guess what? That's what's going to happen. This whole, and for some of you Christians, you're, you're stuck with this silly idea that free will, libertarian free will has to do with coercion or forcing. No, it's the ability, ability to have done otherwise. Can you do otherwise if the future is set? No. Is the future set? Well, if God knows it, then it's set. If he knows what's actually going to happen, then that's what's going to happen because God doesn't know incorrectly. Now, how do you get out of this? You got to weaken the omniscience of God. The difference is that on determinism, there are causal strings attached, as it were, which necessitate his false beliefs. Right? On Molinism, there are no... There <laughs> Omniscient God necessitates where I'm going to end up, heaven or hell, because he knows it. I understand what guys like Tim Stratton are doing. He's saying it's not a direct cause. Maybe Tim, guys like Tim could even admit, okay, Doug, I see what you're saying, but it's indirect cause. So then I, it helps me sleep at night. To say it's an indirect cause okay whatever helps you sleep at night but the bottom line is if god is sovereign and if god creates knowing what would happen that's what's going to happen that's what's going to happen god's not like a okay what's doug going to choose today what's he going to choose today i'm, I'm going to wait for him to make his choice and then i can say i know it no he knows what i'm going to choose and that's what i'm going to choose I could not have done otherwise. No causal strings, physical or metaphysical, attached, which necessitate how he thinks and ultimately believes. I'm now, watching myself. <laughs> I look so funny. <laughs> these important thoughts and ultimately his beliefs are up to Pine Creek and not to someone or something else. They're up to Pine Creek. Okay. I can even give you that. They're up to Pine Creek, but God knew what I would choose, created me anyhow, so he's responsible for me going to hell because he knew I would freely choose to reject him if I die that way. And he could have freely chosen, God could have freely chosen not to create me. So you're in the same boat as the Calvinist, Tim. You basically have to look up to your God and say, why did you create people for goodness sake? Just so we could smell the flowers, feel your love. I mean, if we didn't exist, we're not going to miss any of those things. So Pine Creek, uh, you know, as you know, you get to be careful and handle your thoughts uh, 
responsibly. God can be careful and handle his creation responsibly or no creation. If I were God and I truly was loving, I would not have created a single human if I knew what would happen. Why? Why, you ask? Well, because I don't need them. Because I am a perfect being. I don't need Tim Stratton to worship me and love me. But if there's a chance that I, well, not a chance, if I know he's going to reject me, why would, and, I, and I've set up the system of heaven and hell, and hell's a really bad place, why would I create? It's ridiculous. I'd rather just go golfing by myself. It'd be lonely. To reach your beliefs. Right. And I think that's the key, Tim. And we're going to be uh, diving into this a little bit later whenever we really focus in and hone in on the episode that we did with Colton and Tyler. But there's, there's multiple times in that video where Colton and both Tyler say that we're deliberating, we're doing this, we're doing that. And yeah, yet, well, even this whole idea of freely choosing, like the Bible itself says that the world is one of the spiritual warfare. You got powers of principalities tugging you one way or another. You got how you're raised by humans influence you one way or another. How free are you really when it comes to the salvation issue? Like, really? Born in an area where gospel's never preached? How free are you to accept Jesus? Confess the mouth with your mouth, Jesus, if you've never heard of Jesus' name in the first place. How free really are you? How free really are you when you're bo uh, born in the southern United States and you got Christian parents and Christian friends and everybody's Christian and... And if you leave Christianity, you'll hurt people's feelings and your mom and dad will cry. And like you got so much influencing pulling you one way. And then you got the world pulling you another way. How free really are you? And then you got the whispers of the demon and then the evil one tempting you. And then you got the, your, some Christians believe in guardian angels or angels saving you and helping you. Man, if you really think about it, this whole idea of free will starts to look more like you're a pawn in a chess game. Same time that God is determining, no, my argument is that you are not. What makes you, you is not deliberating. You are merely a passive cog that <laughs> is experiencing what God has already determined that would happen inside of your brain, right? Inside of your head, which is making you do, causing you, if we even want to say it like that, to, you to do th whatever God has determined. And so I think that I, I think that's absolutely a beautiful uh, answer to Pine Creek's question, is that the difference is that you, Pine Creek, are the one that's doing your reasoning. And You're why am I doing that reasoning? Because I exist. Why do I exist? Because God created me. And knowing what I would do with my reasoning. That's the problem. If I don't go to heaven when I die, or at the final judgment day, whenever, it's because of what God didn't do in me. Or it's because God created me knowing not what I would do. Either way, God's guilty, guilty, guilty of creating. You can't put creation on the shoulders of humans in your worldview. That's all on God. And if you want to uphold God as creator and at the same time God is omniscient, knowing what will happen before the creation even started, you're in trouble. And let me say this to the open theists who might be listening. You're not out of the woods either. Well, the future doesn't exist yet, so God doesn't know it. So, so I mean, hey, we open theists, we're free of this. No, you're not. Because you still think 
God is some type of mega, mega human who can, who's really, really smart and can see every cause and effect. And an entity like that should be able to predict with a high level of confidence what will happen. Unless you're an open theist that said, yeah, I'm going to create humans and, whoa, I never saw that coming, that they would reject me. I'm a perfect parent. I'm a perfect father. Where did this come from? Even though I created Satan and I saw, I mean, I created an angel named Lucifer and it turned into Satan. Even though I have precedent of, of bad things that can happen. I never expected this from humans. So open theists, don't, don't pat yourself on the back. The one that's deliberating. And so that that's that's one of the things that blew me away about this whole entire conversation is that in, in the conversations that were previously had before on the Calvinist view, God's determining on your view, Tim, you're determining what. what no, see, this is where we disagree. God's still determining it by simply knowing and actualizing it. Knowing and actualizing it equals determining. There is. In my view, there is no difference between allowing and causing when you're an omniscient, omnipotent being. There's, let me say that again. There's no difference between allowing something to happen and determining something to happen if you're an omniscient, omnipotent being with free will. Because you could have stopped everything, and you didn't. What, what's taking place and so yeah. i just yeah i i don't see how people don't get it but anyway <laughs> that's just me and i think that's directly relevant to what i was saying before about yeah. the 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 let's say priority or the contingency of either omniscience or the decree is that you because it's it's rooted in god's omniscience and mm -hmm. not in god's determination you are still yeah this is the big problem they think that those are two separate things and they think they can get out of it with Molinism. You can't. Meaning, being the source of your decisions, your actions, your thoughts and beliefs. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you decide not to believe, God's knowledge is not the cause or the source of that rejection. But that's irrelevant. God caused you. That's the point, Joshua. God caused you knowing what you would do. So I can even grant you that libertarian free will all day long. It doesn't make a dent. God caused you, which caused you to freely reject. All you're doing is you're inserting a little extra step in there and saying, oh, we're free from, from saying it's God's fault. Mm -hmm. And that's what's most relevant about that. Uh, Trevor's asked, will you take a call from a Christian right now? I'm trying to get my brother to call in. Yeah, I'll take a call. Uh, tag me when he's ready. Question. He asked specifically, how is it different than causing? Mm -hmm. That's exactly why it's different than causing. Yeah. And, and like you said just now, Tyler, it's like if, if, you, if you bring it back into the de determinism camp, um, it's like this is and I don't I don't actually know of any uh, anybody that's that's used this term specifically, but I would like it like the 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 term experiential will. Mm -hmm. You have a will. If you want to call it that you have a will, but it's confined to the uh, is his name Wes. Is that who wants to call in? Just Hi, now, Wes. Tyler. Hey, how you doing? Good. That was quick. You you noticed the tab was open. You you stopped the tab so people didn't hear the replay. Excellent job. <laughs> Do what I can. Thanks for taking my call. Are you the guy who is the uh, brother-in-law of someone in the chat? Uh, so I have a brother named Trevor who's listening to you right now. So it sounds like that's adding up. Yeah. Okay. And you're a Christian. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, and did you want to ask me questions or do you want me to ask you questions? Well, I was hoping to interact with, uh, what I was hearing you talk about for the past few minutes. Excellent. I like that. Okay. What do you want to say? 
Cool. Um, let me ask you a couple of questions, if that's all right, and then let me yep. outline a scenario. Um, we can get into this more if you want, but first, are you familiar with conditionalism? Conditionalism. Uh, no, I'm going to say no. Okay, maybe we can get back into that then. Um, second, from your comments, uh, do you believe that free will is even possible in a system with a God? Because it sounds like, uh, obviously, you're an atheist, but if you grant the premise of a God, it sounds like you are necessarily a determinist. And when you say free will, what do you mean by it? I mean actual agency by someone not God. See, that really doesn't help me. Act what is actual agency? <laughs> sure. I mean, uh, someone is actually responsible for what they chose and that in many situations they are actually free to choose what they will. It still right? doesn't really help me. Like, like for example, I view um, when someone makes a choice, what actually makes it free that they could have done otherwise, right? Or do you have a different definition? Well, so certainly no one has complete uh, freedom of action, right? Um, that would be silly. There's, there's things that we cannot choose to do. We're restrained in many right. uh, regards. But let's say it's choosing between steak and chicken for dinner. Sure. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, that would work in, in that instance. Yeah, you can choose one thing okay. or the other. So my understanding is that if I choose chicken over steak and I could have chosen steak, there's still reasons why I chose one over another, even if I'm not, maybe not aware of them. Mm -hmm. And so then I have to ask myself, well, what caused me to choose the chicken? Well, it's because I have some, there's some reasons in my brain that I'm not even aware of. And what caused those reasons? Well, I, I don't know. And there's, there's a causal chain, but to answer your question directly, I will grant you that, yes, it's possible. Well, and, and we can go there, but I want to interact with what you just said, because I've, I've heard this from people before. So to me, uh, you do not really believe in free will anyway, because right. if, if I, I lean giving... deterministic right now. Yeah. OK. OK. So it's difficult to interact then uh, in a way, because your argument undermines rationality itself, does it not? the the very arguments we're using right now are not based well, it depends on, on how you define rationality reasons. well well sure but hear me out uh the arguments we're giving each other right now are not based on logic or reason i'm not choosing to say them it's just because of you know what i had for lunch yesterday and how much caffeine is in my blood and um what happened to me when i was three years old all coming that, together and that could and be true really, yeah but it, it sounds like there's not really a truth okay i'm going to try truth. something with you what if I concede that there's no such thing as rationality and reason? But we're still talking here. Uh-huh. What are you going to say then? Then the results of our conversation to you will ultimately be meaningless. Why? Because, because if you don't believe in truth and rationality, then what we're doing is... Well, you added a new term in our truth, but, let, let, mm -hmm. but let's say rationality and reason, let's say I say they don't exist. Mm -hmm. But we are not omniscient. And so every word coming out of your mouth has been predetermined. Every word coming out of my mouth has been predetermined. But we don't know all the causes and effects. We don't even know what we're going to say next because, you know, it's predetermined. But we don't have access to that, all those cause and effects. So we act like we're free even if we're not. We act like we're reasoning even if we're not. We act like we're rational even if we're not. Yeah, and, and I've heard that line of argument before. So I think that amounts to a, a fundamental disagreement. And, and maybe we're getting off a little bit because I want to talk about the, the heaven and hell thing. But I do think at a certain point, it's, it's difficult for someone who does not believe in free will under any circumstances to interact with Christians. Do you believe in free will? Yes, I do. That you could have done otherwise? Yeah, sure. So if God knew that you would choose the chicken instead of the steak, before you chose, could you have chosen? He knew I was going to make a mistake because why would you choose chicken over steak? You can have chicken anytime. But would, could you have done otherwise? Could I have done otherwise if God had already known? See, so all that is is a syntactical trap, right? No, it's a simple question. Could you have chosen the steak if God knew you were going to choose the chicken? 
Yes. Are you familiar with quantum collapse? You are you familiar with with quantum collapse, uh, Schrodinger's cat, uh, co-equal uh, identities, qubits, things of that sort. Yeah, but <laughs> I for, feel okay. I for, feel for like you're, you're... No, let me let me let me say this for those listening because a lot of people probably and your your mic just went crackly. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, is that a little better? Maybe I'm talking a little softer. No, and I've this ha has happened to other people who have called in on mobile before. Um. Oh, I know why. Try turning off your... Are you on mobile? Yeah, I'm on mobile. Here, what if I move? Is that better? Try re try refreshing this this tab. You'll come immediately back in. Okay. Like on the top left. Top left. You see the little circle? Yeah. Is that any? Yeah, the crackling's gone. Oh. I don't know how many times we're gonna have to do this, but anyhow. Sorry about that. But, yeah. But let's before we go down the rabbit hole of quantum collapse and all that. Well, this is terribly relevant. Let me. It's a short rabbit hole. Okay. If you were, because ahead. I want to answer your question about choosing the chicken or the steak. Could you have done differently? So, uh, for those who aren't familiar, uh, the example that they use is something called Schrodinger's cat. And without getting into all the minutia, it's this thought experiment that was originally, ironically, intended as a reductio ad absurdum, but eventually turned out to be true based on what we know of quantum theory. So the thought experiment says you've got a cat in a, in a lead cage. You can't see through it. You have no interaction with it. And you're shooting photons at this, you know, sheet of, of gold material, whatever. And because of quantum uncertainty, you don't know exactly where the thing's going to land. If it lands in a certain place. Uh, inside the box, there's going to be a gas release. The cat's going to die. If it doesn't, then the cat's not going to die. And so you shoot the photon and due to uncertainty, you don't know where it is. And since you have not yet observed what happened to the cat, uh, it is in concurrent states of life and death, right? You're familiar. Let me see if I can set that there. Uh, you're, you're familiar with that thought experiment, correct? Okay. Now relate this back to the steak and chicken. Okay. So this is very similar with what we do with qubits, right? This is gonna be very short, I promise. Um, so a traditional computer uses a binary system where each switch can either be zero or one. It can be on or off. Quantum computers are so powerful because when we can create a qubit uh, for moments at a time, it can either be zero, one, or both simultaneously. But see, once something in the quantum world is observed, it comes into the macro and those quantum possibilities collapse into what actually happened. And so, yes, I could have chosen differently with the steak or the chicken. And until I made that choice, even if someone had foreknowledge, until I made that choice, I was in concurrent states of choosing both. And once I chose the chicken, that is what happened. But prior to that, yes, I could have chosen differently. Did God know you were going to choose chicken? Sure. But foreknowledge does neg not negate action. So if God knew you were going to choose chicken before you chose chicken... I love that we're talking about chicken. It seems silly. I'm into it. Could you have chosen steak? Yes. Then God would have been wrong. No. Because he thought you both, because he thought you were going to choose chicken. Both things are true until one happens. This is what quantum theory teaches us about the fabric underlying the universe. So God doesn't know with certainty until it happens? No, he knows it. But it hasn't. What happened. do you mean he knows because it? Happening is a real thing, right? When you say God knows that you're going to choose chicken, mm -hmm. that means that you're going to choose chicken. Let me ask you this. If I imagine making a sandwich, is that sandwich exist until I make it? No. No, exactly. Okay. So that decision has not yet come into reality. Okay. Now, but this is, this is my main point. God, can he know things that... Uh, haven't been chosen yet. Sure. Just like I can imagine a sandwich. Okay. Not yet. Made. Oh, he's imagining it. So he sees, Concept but he's conceptualizing. But, okay. But he mind. sees, he sees that you're going to choose chicken. Okay. Can God be wrong about that? Uh, no, he's not going to be wrong. So that means if a day later, Looking hmm. back, 
you could not have chosen steak. Right? No. Incorrect. Because chronology matters. And again, what I'm trying to explain, I know it's it's a, a strange thing because we, this is not something in the macro, uh, but quantum collapse is a real thing. And this is what we observe with possibility coming into reality. Does God and need so, quantum collapse in order for this to work? He created quantum collapse. He created quantum collapse. Mm -hmm. Did he know that quantum collapse would exist before he created it? Um, I would guess so, yeah. This is, this is actually a mechanism for free will, right? Because at a literal scientific level, uh, we have demonstration that two things exist simultaneously until one is brought into being by observation. And so, yes, free will. Okay, Absolutely. okay. So you're saying that when God knows that I will choose chicken, he actually knows I will choose chicken and steak because they both exist simultaneously until one is actualized. I feel like you keep taking time out of the equation. No, so I'm keeping it in. Something coming, something coming to pass is a real thing. Right. So if I'm imagining a sandwich, I'll make it three o'clock. The sandwich is not real. It will be. Right. At three o'clock, it's real. And if you say, looking back at two o'clock, was there a sandwich? Well, no, Doug, there wasn't. I mean, we're looking backwards now. So if you're looking backwards in time. No, no, but you can still say, looking backwards in time, Doug created a sandwich. Even though it's gone now, he ate it. No. If you go backwards in time, you would say he will create a sandwich. What are you There's talking still a about? Part of me. There's still a little part of me that gets tickled that we're talking so seriously about sandwiches. Don't worry about Check. being tickled. If <laughs> <laughs> quote, if does God know when you're gonna the day day and hour you'll die? Let's get biblical here. He does. Okay. Okay. okay let's say that's when you're 85. Okay. Do you have the free will to commit suicide tomorrow? Yes. And let's say you do it. Well, in that case, God's foreknowledge would have been incorrect. Ah, right? but God's foreknowledge is never incorrect, is it? Correct. So your example is silly. <laughs> My example is silly because it shows that. Yes. No, no. <laughs> because you just, you just set up a syntactic trap. You said, God knows this, but then you defy it. Ha ha. God either doesn't know everything or you aren't free to choose. What no, is trappish about that? Okay. Possibilities exist simultaneously until one is brought into being. Okay. Are you saying God knows possibilities or does he know actualities? He knows both. Okay. So he knows what you'll, when you'll actually, actually die, right? Yes. So if you commit suicide tomorrow, when God actually, actually knew that you died 80, God knew wrong, that never happened. So you don't have the free will to commit suicide tomorrow. You're familiar with the term leisure de mom. What's your first name? Because you, you're always doing this. Are you familiar with this? Are you familiar with this? You're trying to explain something that's incredibly simple using something incredibly complex. So taking a necessary component out of, a, out of an argument uh, does not mean proper simplification. And you have to look at time. My name is Wes, by the way. Wes. So okay. what you're doing when you say, okay, if God knows you're going to die at 85, you know, God knows uh, you're going to die at 85, you're presenting a given. And I say, yes. And you say, but what if you commit suicide at 42? Well, you just violated your own given, right? So you're not actually engaging with no. what I'm saying. Are, are you saying that possibilities do not exist concurrently until one is chosen? No. You're... Okay, so you agree that possibilities exist concurrently until one is chosen. Yes. There is your free will. But when God knows something, is it just a possibility or is it an actual? Until it happens, it is a possibility. Oh, ah, now you're going because now I'm you're saying not. something different than you said just five minutes ago, I think. No, that's exactly what I'm saying. Does God's God know that does God a possibility until it happens? Wes, does God know right. that you're gonna die at eighty? Is that he knows it possibly or actually? He knows what the possibilities are going to collapse into, but until they collapse, they are both true. This is what quantum theory teaches us. So until you choose a steak or the uh, chicken, both the steak and chicken, those both choices exist simultaneously. Yes. 
Okay. But God only knows the possibility of it, not the actual what you're going to choose. No, I believe he, he knows, but knowledge and action are not the same thing. This is, I, and, and maybe I'm not saying move, that. Maybe we, can, maybe we can move on from this event because I did want to get into what you were talking about with, with heaven and hell. Um, and, and maybe we just have a fundamental disagreement about determinism here. But no, I, I'm saying if I imagine the sandwich I'll make at three o'clock, I can know for sure I'm going to make that sandwich at three o'clock, that it is going to be real, but it's not real until I do it. That's ah, so God knows when you're going to die at 80, but he it's not r real knowing. No, it hasn't happened yet. It's real knowing. And, and I, I think we just have a fundamental disagreement. So it's difficult to talk. I, I think you don't like that idea and you have to defend it to the hilt because then that makes God morally responsible for all evil. Well, let's talk about that. So can we get into uh, what you were talking about? And you're going to have to refresh that? again because you're oh, crackling okay. again. Let me do that. Sorry about that. Let's see. Am I wrong? This is why he's pushing back because he realizes if he doesn't, then God's responsible. Okay. Is that better? Yeah. I don't know why it always does that after about five minutes. Okay. So um, I was listening to your argument earlier, and I will say, let me say this. I think that there is some merit to the idea that, uh, let me put it this way. So you're saying that uh, God is sort of capriciously making people to torture them in hell, basically, right? So No, uh, I never said capriciously. I'm saying that if God created, knowing what would happen, then he's responsible for his creation. Okay. Um, I think that there is a difference between mechanism and action, right? So to me, uh, with you leaning on foreknowledge, I think of it like this. So I, I have a young son. And I know his personality well enough to where a lot of times I know what he's going to do. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's say I put him to bed and I say, hey, if you sneak out of bed, I'm going to punish you. And he sneaks out of bed and I punish him. If he gets angry and says to me, this is actually your fault because you knew I'd sneak out of bed. That's very silly. And it's just. Okay. Let's use that example. Life, right. Uh, let's say sneaking out of bed was the worst possible evil ever. It isn't, but let's say it was. Okay. Like way worse than murder or rape. Sneaking mm -hmm. out of bed is bad, bad, bad. Okay. And let's say before you even conceived your son with your wife, you knew that your son would someday sneak out of bed. Would you create your son? This is an odd thought experiment it's odd to you because the answer is no okay you uh, wouldn't. yes even even if i knew that my son would do bad things yes i would still create him okay. right? i'm because just not bad I things i'm bed. talking about sneaking out of bed is the is is the worst possible thing ever and mm -hmm. you and i forgot to mention this you don't like that you do not like sneaking out of bed in your mind this is the worst gratuitous sin ever and let's say most mm -hmm. people don't do it in fact almost everybody doesn't do it but you have foreseen perfectly that your son if you create him will sneak out of bed question would you create your son so is there more than one person that i'm creating in this example you said most people don't do it most people so won't. let's say just your son right now Probably not. Yes, that's the correct answer. You wouldn't create your son. But if you said that there's going to be a hundred people and some of them will and some of them don't, it's a very different question. Well, I can ask the same question of each parent for all those other hundred and they would say, I hope the same as you. No, I wouldn't create. Now I'll apply that to your God. See, but you understand how that's a different question. Why? Right? Why is it different? Because you're granting individual agency to the creators over only one single creator, creation, I mean. And that's a very different okay, question. Okay, for, forget anybody else does it. It's just you and your son then, if that's what's uh, Just you. one son or? Just or one son. Just you and your one son. Would you create your one son? You answered no. Probably not. Sure. Okay. Does God like sin? 
No, God doesn't like sin. He also created more than How about just a little bit of sin? Is he okay with that? Just a little bit. Well, what do you mean with okay with? Does he desire it? Does he want it? Does he does he like it? Does he is he uh permissive he, of it? Well, he's he's often patient. He's often merciful, but no, he doesn't like it. He doesn't want sin, sure. Okay. In fact, he hates it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Does God need people? No. Does God have free will? Yes. So he didn't have to make people. He could have done otherwise. Sure. So he created people knowing with certainty mm -hmm. that they would sin something he hates. Mm -hmm. And he would have been okay, all right, content, peaceful, happy by not creating. Presumably. Yeah. So why did he create? Because God is himself a community and he creates out of his being. Let me, let me outline this. You said uh, that you weren't familiar with conditionalism. I'd like to very quickly outline it for you. I have a feeling right. you're going to talk for about two minutes and it's going to go nowhere. Well, I guess we'll have to wait and see what collapses. Okay, the, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so conditionalism is very popular, uh, very common amongst the church fathers, right? And in modern Western Protestantism, uh, we don't see it as often, but it is a historical belief of the church and a very large number of people believe it today. Conditionalism is the understanding from the scriptures that if someone dies without Christ, right? Let's say in the modern era, let's say they've heard the gospel um, and they've rejected it, right? They've heard about Christ and they've rejected him. So conditionalism understands from the scriptures that what happens is they were given life as a gift. They were uh, free to a great degree to do what they wanted to do with it. And at the end of their life, they're judged for their choices. Uh, and if they committed sins, right? If they uh, committed crimes, they'll be punished for their crimes in a way that what does justice mean? It means what is due to someone. So for whatever time or severity is due to someone for their times, they suffer in hell. And then in the lake of fire, when their sentence is finished, they are destroyed and they no longer have being. Right. Okay, now why, so this is, why are you telling this me is this? Conditional. <clears throat> because uh, I think that that negates a lot of the a lot of the arguments against God's justice. So if if life is itself a gift and people have free will to do what they will with it, okay, we have this incredible thing called uh, called eternal life, which is possible through Christ. But C.S. Lewis was. Uh, I think rarely incorrect when he said you've never met them, you're mortal, right? Man has always known that he's mortal. That's the, the fundamental uh, basic setting for human beings. And so there is a hereafter. Someone dies without Christ, they're punished in a way that is perfectly just with what they did. And when their sentence is finished... Yeah, but this is all irrelevant to what we were talking about earlier because... Um, actually, can you refresh and then we'll go again. And, and hang, hang on. And also plug in your phone if you haven't plugged in. That could be the problem. Like, yeah, actually put the charger in. Because I think it's crackling because your smartphone's um, using too much resources on the video and then the audio is being compensated. Yeah, let me or, grab my charger. Or degraded. Degraded. Um, why is why is that irrelevant? Isn't this ultimately a because a there'd be there'd be no justice. there'd be no issue of heaven or hell or gifts or not if God never created in the first place? So we got to talk about why did God create in the first place? Well, when the thing is finished, if those who endure have everlasting glory and pleasure, and those who did not make it no longer exist, then is that not a net positive of goodness in the universe? Yeah, let's talk about that after. Did you find your charger? I'll give it a right now. And then refresh. Okay. Yeah, anybody know why it's crackling? Yeah, he could try to turn the camera off, but I really want to see his face. It like it really helps with the communication. Okay, hopefully that works. Okay, um, 
there was a time, in quotes, when it was just God who ex existed and nothing else, right? All right. Do you believe that? Yeah. Like, there was an act of creation. Um, that world of just God alone, you let me know if I'm describing it correctly. It's a world okay. of all love, all power, all knowing, um, a trinity. Okay. You agree with all that? Yeah. Perfection, right? You agree with that? That that sure. world of God alone is perfection. So here's my question to you. Can you get better than that world? Uh, is two cookies better than one cookie if you really like cookies? Yes. Great. So, yeah. Um, the Bible makes very clear that God has an interest in sharing his glory. Um, in Ephesians, it talks about so that the riches of his kindness may be known. Okay, known. so you're saying you can get better than God alone. I'm saying that God is able to increase the amount of, of goodness if he wants to. No, no. Right? My question is, are you saying you can get better than God alone who's all perfect? So this is, this is a syntactical trap, is it not? Right. So uh, having somebody like sharing goodness with somebody is not saying the goodness was not good before. I'm saying it is a good thing that he is sharing goodness. Yeah. And so in, in a sense, I mean, what is infinity time? But it's not better well, than I God alone, is it? Well, see, we're starting to deal with things that break the human brain, right? What is infinity minus one? Infinity. What is infinity times 100? It's infinity. Right. You can't add yeah. or subtract from infinity. It's just infinity. We have difficulty with that. Well, let me put it in terms of sin. In the world of God alone, is there any sin? No. In a world of God plus creation, is there sin? For a time. Which would you prefer if you were God? It, knowing that you hate sin. Mm -hmm. A world with no sin or a world with good, but also sin. Do you have a good working definition for the word glory? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I mean it. It's it's important. This this is something that would be terribly significant to most of humanity throughout most of our history. We don't we don't talk about the concept of glory very much in our time and place, but this is a, a very important thing for most of humanity. Glory is a good definition I've heard is beauty on display. Right? Okay. And so the act of creation and the story and the redemption and the glorification at the end is glorious. And he thought that was Did worth God doing. need? Does God need glory? Need doesn't uh, factor into it. If an, does an artist need to make a beautiful painting? Some do. Yeah, I'd say all of them do. But but they don't. They don't die if they don't, right? Well, but they might be unhappy. Well, sure. I mean, I'm I'm a writer. I I write for a living. I, so is I God unhappy? Would God have been unhappy if he wouldn't have created? No, he's still able to be content. And is right? And if God's a Trinity, can't he demonstrate his glory amongst the Trinity? Sure, and he does. Okay, so you don't need people. But he, he wanted them. He wanted them. So, so you, you keep coming back to need. Okay, right? let's use the word want. Does God want sin? So there are some things that we incur on the process to something we do want, right? Does God want sin? Yeah. Well, no, but it's going to cease. And through it, right, something glorious happened. And that's worth doing. So if God doesn't want sin, he doesn't need humans. He's A-OK -okay without creation because he's perfect. Mm -hmm. And if he knew with 100% certainty that what he would create would lead to something he hates, you don't see a problem with that. I find a problem with your formulation because it doesn't ultimately lead to something that he hates, right? If I want to write a novel, you can say, hey, do you love being frustrated? Well, no, I don't love being frustrated, but being frustrated is going to be uh, something that I incur in the process. But once the novel's finished, my frustration is in the past and I have a beautiful work of art. I mean, hopefully, maybe I wrote a terrible novel, but that's an aside, right? What if, what if you wrote a novel and uh, 10 people read it and three people get great 
joy and pleasure from reading it, reading it. But seven of the 10 people who read it, after they're done reading it, they hate it so much that they commit suicide. Would you create well, that novel? Well, obviously not, but no. I do not find that analogous to God. Let me, let me put the analogy into perspective. And I, I don't know if you believe this, but many Christians out there believe that most people will end up in hell. Mm -hmm. Those are the okay. seven people who commit suicide after reading your novel. That's the analogy. Some people go to heaven. But why does the gate to destruction narrows the gate to life? Those are the three people who read your novel and found great pleasure in it. Do you find life on this earth to be a gift? No. Okay, see, so that's, that's part of the disconnect. So if you fundamentally don't re believe that free will is possible, and you believe that life itself is Why are we talking about possible? gifts and free will when we're talking about because, this Because you're only, talking, you're only talking as if existence is merely suffering. Right. And that, I, and it isn't, but did right? you, I think I just, so, I, I think I just asked you, would you create that novel? And you said no. Right. Yeah. But that's not analogous to God and creation. Right. Because in the example of me, right. In the micro example, someone committing suicide is the final act in terms as this world is concerned. Right. Um, and when hell is go, the final act in this analogy. Okay. So I'm a conditionalist which I believe is the historical uh, position of the church, which means that people are given life as a gift. They are free to do what they will with it. They are punished if they have committed crimes. When their just punishment is over, they cease okay. to exist. No he, longer experience. Uh, that, that make, I, agree, no. I agree with you that that's, it helps make the analogy not too bad, but you're still stuck with things like uh, God created knowing that rape, murder will happen. And he saw it. He said, you know what? I'm going to create it anyhow. Mm -hmm. Right? That's, you believe that, right? So Christians believe that every wrong will be made right. So it is not inconsistent <laughs> to look at the end picture. You don't have to make it right if there's no people existing. Well, so here's my, my question to you. Would you take five, five seconds of extreme pain for a million dollars? Yes. There you go. Oh, but, so God was willing to have five seconds of sin in order to have some people go to heaven. So this is, this is part of my issue, right? A lot of times, no, no, I, I'm, I'm going along with what you're saying. Um, we can sometimes get so trapped in this binary of, okay, somebody either goes to heaven or goes to hell. Okay, sure, right? But there is a purpose to this life. And unfortunately, sometimes we miss that. Like I said, glory is a concept that matters here. And so uh, you can choose to do good in this life. You can cho choose to do evil in this life. You can choose to build great things. And, and that has to factor into this somehow, right? Because this life is not just, oh, hey, say the sinner's prayer or don't, and then we're basically waiting around to die. That's really not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches the redemption of all things, right? The gospel is the gospel of the kingdom. The gospel is the kingdom of God is, is at hand, which means within your reach, uh, so repent, which means turn around, change your mind, do things differently, right? So that we uh, get to be part of this great story of redeeming a fallen creation to make things better. All again. this is irrelevant. I mean, because from the perspective, relevant, it's true. from the perspective of whether this omni God should create or not, okay. If he doesn't create, then you don't need a plan of salvation. If he doesn't create, you don't need uh, wrongs to be righted. It, if you don't create, there's no sin. Yeah. So, so let me answer that. If I if I never write a novel, I will never have gone through the frustration inherent in writing a novel. But I also will have no books on my shelves. The glorious deeds will be left undone. If at the end of time, the only beings that exist are those who have endured and receive great glory and pleasures forevermore at the right hand of the Father, is humanity in a good place or a bad place? If the only ones who are left existing are the ones experiencing eternal joy, is humanity in a better place or a worse place? Humanity? Better. Yes. But God doesn't need to be better. Then I guess it's an act of generosity. 
an act of generosity that some that yes. he created a world where some murder or rape will happen? So there again, we believe in a God who heals. We believe in a God who is just, who will right every wrong. We believe in the great white throne of judgment. That's all irrelevant. And it's not irrelevant. Yeah, it is. Because, because God... No, it isn't. Because the frustration is impossible. If I'm Why do murders happen? Because people kill each other. Out of, Why do out people of... exist? Why do people exist? Yeah. Do you mean a direct cause or do you mean a... a uh, do you believe God created problem. humans? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, the buck stops at the top. The reason why murders exist is because God created. So what you're doing there is you're skipping uh, a piece of the puzzle, right? So I, I know what you're going to say, that there's this free will and people choose, right? But God created people from your worldview with the free will to commit murder, right? Do you think that Smith and Wesson, oh, maybe this is a bad example. Um, yes, there's partial responsibility for gun uh, owners. There's partial responsibility okay, for about, bartenders who give alcohol to people who okay, are drunk. how about this? Let, let me pick something more neutral then. Um, is, uh, is Rawlings responsible if a guy beats someone else to death with one of their baseball bats? No, I don't. I think their because, responsibility is very low, if, if not zero. Yes, I agree with you. Because... Beating someone to death with a baseball bat is express is going against the express purpose of that object. The Bible teaches that man was created for good works. That is what he is for. That was what he was made for. And so if man uses his agency contrary to that proper purpose, it is now, like the baseball example, wholly upon them because they have misused a good gift. Yeah, still all re irrelevant because God knew that people would misuse his gift. Quantum collapse. So uh, what kind type of Christian are you? Are you you're not a universalist? No. Do you believe some people will go to hell? Yes. And the lake of fire, which is the second death, is obliteration after sentences. Are okay, so they will be uh, punished and then annihilated. Eventually, yes. Okay. Um, Which I believe is the, the clear teaching of Scripture. Okay. And all that could be avoided if God never created it. I think you agree with that, right? Yeah, but I think you have glory because he did. Right? So I what? Think it's like he doesn't need, the God, you've, you've admitted, I think, that you, God doesn't need glory. Are, are you a total utilitarian? Did you need the sauce on your hamburger? Did you need to spend that time with your friend? I'm not a perfect being. I'm selfish. I well, need sure, sauce if, on my if burger. We're make an analogy. <laughs> no, you, you don't. You don't, though. You're not going to die if you don't put sauce on your burger. Well, you yeah, like need it in a certain sense. Yeah, like a little bit. I like it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. This, but God doesn't like sin. He, in fact, he hates it. I don't like frustration. I like writing novels. Yeah. There, there are things that you encounter on the way to something you want. We're, we're not. We're never going to see eye to eye on this because I think. You know that if you start thinking like I'm thinking about this, your God becomes a schmuck. That's okay. So all of a sudden we're switching into uh, assuming the motivation yes. of others. And that's, I'm that's psychologizing you. Right? No, no, seriously. Okay. Seriously. But the, the moment, think the about moment this. I engage in that, all of a sudden we're calling each other names. No, 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 no. I'm, not, call, yeah, I'm no. not calling you names. I'm just saying that if you started to think like me, you could no longer be a Christian on this topic, right? That is simply a tautology. If I thought like an atheist, I could no, 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 no. Be no. A I, on this topic, sure. if if God, if God said, "Oh, I see this world. I don't need to create this world, but I see it's going to lead to something I hate, and it'll include murder, rape, and and hell, even if it's momentary." Okay. I think you it's really taking, hard for you to remain a Christian at, at that point. You're incorrect because you're taking the middle and calling it the end. It's like talking mean? about somebody. You're taking the middle and calling it the end. You say, oh, this results in these horrible things. And I say, that isn't how it ends. Take my novel example. Or we do a new, a new example. Let's say I want to go to the gym because I want to get strong. And you take a picture of me straining to pick up some weight and it hurts and I don't like it. And you say, why would you go to the gym if it's going to end in pain? Well, it doesn't end in pain. Pain is the process, right? So, so this is where we have fundamental disagreements. Is, is uh, and I realized, you know, maybe 
maybe we've said all that I think said you, I in think this conversation. I, I but am... if you if you don't believe free will is possible, right? <laughs> and and you don't acknowledge that at the end I of said things it was can be different. Rewind the tape. Watch it back. I gave it to you. Okay, but for the sake of argument, right? No, no. I li honestly believe it's free uh, that it's possible. O almost. Okay. In other you, words, you're undecided. Whenever exactly. someone asks me, "Is something possible?" I almost always say yes because unless it's an axiomatic contradiction. Okay. You are not inclined to believe that free. Yeah, and I said I lean determinist. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Yeah, but I do so. think that I'm right. And the reason why I think I'm right about <laughs> about no about your pushing back on this so hard is because of your um, sneaking out of bed analogy. When I asked you, would you create a son that would sneak out of bed, knowing that sneaking out of the bed is the worst possible sin ever, worst possible thing ever, you said no, I wouldn't. Boom, you're done at that point because you have just said then that God should not have created. No, I have it because you're mixing up uh, you're mixing up something with a single variable with something with many variables. Right, it may, so, which makes it even worse for God. No, if I say, let's put it this way: if I say uh, you're going to shoot free throws and you only get to shoot one free throw and you have to miss your first free throw, and I get to punch you when you miss and you have to miss, would you do that? No, of course not. If I said, okay, you're going to shoot free throws and I get to punch you for everyone you miss and you get a million dollars for everyone you make, you would take that all day. It's, it's not analogous because some things matter on the balance, right? On the balance. So you're, you're... Well, in that sense. And, and like I said, the other problem is you keep defining things by the middle. So at the end, right, when all that exists is glory and all these new people are able to participate in it, humanity is greatly benefited. What percentage, so what percentage of thing. humanity do you think goes to heaven, if you were to guess? If, if at the end justice is served and those who have been punished no longer have existence or being, does it matter? So you don't want to answer that question? No, I'm saying it doesn't matter, right? I know. I okay, mean, if, if it, it doesn't matter, matters, then answer the question. It matters in the sense that we want people to experience that. If it doesn't but matter, saying, answer the question. I'm saying that... Uh, Just a guess. The glory, because of the eternal weight of glory... Right. So there's that passage. It talks about outweighing the suffering and it does. In order so to outweigh percent, the suffering, I, you got to tell answer this question. What percentage of people I, I will end have, up in heaven? And you just a guess. What's your intuition say? It will, be, it will be nothing short of arbitrary for me to venture a guess. I have no over 50 percent or under 50 percent. I have no idea. Yeah, you impossible. do have an idea because it's in your scriptures. It says that the way is narrow. So the path that you and few is narrow. find it and few find it and few find it. No, okay. What, so you sure. should say, based on scripture, okay, sure. less than fifty percent of people go to heaven. Okay, sure. And it's probably lower than that, way lower than fifty percent. Impossible. So now know. you're, yeah. if you're going to give this scales of balance thing that God created, because in the end, mm -hmm. in the end, in the end, with heaven, the rights will be uh, outweighed the wrongs by a lot amount. You got less than half of the people who are ending up in heaven, and most people going, being punished severely, and then being annihilated, and then you got all the crap in between of of rapes and murders here on earth as we're doing soul building. I mean. How does how does the math on on that work out? Jesus describes the parable of the wheat and the tares, right? So, uh, somebody for those who aren't familiar, somebody sows uh, a field of wheat, and in the night, somebody who hates that guy comes and throws a bunch of weed seed in there, um, weeds, and it starts growing. The guy's servants say, "Hey, didn't you plant high quality seed? What's going on here? There's a bunch of weeds." And uh, you know, he says, "Yeah, somebody else did this because we used we used good wheat seed." And they say, should we tear out the weeds? And he says, no, because they're tangled up with the good stuff right now. If you tear out the weeds, we're going to lose the wheat too. And so what we're going to do is we're going to let them grow up all the way. And when they dry out, we will then separate them on the threshing floor and we'll burn the weeds and we'll have the wheat. So yeah, this, this is what scripture teaches. At the end of things, humanity is greatly benefited because those who did not uh, choose the right path, ceased to exist, and the fact that they were given life at all was a tremendous act of generosity and blessing. They got to choose what they did with it. And for those who do endure, uh, eternal glory.
<laughs> yeah, there's many people who live this life mm-hmm. who end up in hell. And when they live this life, I mean, like they're, they contribute to society. They sure they make mistakes. They do bad things once in a while. But for the most part, you know, mm-hmm. they're OK people. And then they die. And according to you, they'll be punished severely for maybe having a wrong thought at one point or whatever, and then annihilated. And then you got people who can act. They will be, they will be punished in accordance to what they did. Right. That's not the same as, oh, they'll be punished severely. I, I don't know. They will be punished proportionally. Well, do you believe the Christians right. will be punished as well? You need to refresh if you can hear me. Yeah, I should ask him why he even believes any of this is true. Uh, I do. You're going to have to refresh. Okay, he's refreshing now. I don't know why this is happening with the. Do you believe you will be punished? So, uh, I believe there are consequences on Earth during our time here. I do not believe in purgatory, um, but there still will be judgment in terms of uh, people will not all have the same experience in the afterlife. Some people will be uh, getting greater positions, greater honors. So, um, the punishment is taken away eternally. So you're not uh, punished for, for accepting Jesus, but everybody else is. Well, uh, the theologian Doug Wilson says something I think is very, uh, very applicable. He says the sin is the judgment, right? And in this life, if I lie, steal, and cheat. Except for the unbeliever, they get punished after life. Well, which are we talking about right now? I, because I, no, I'm talking about after you're dead. Are you going to be punished? Okay. Are we talking, you said someone who believes in Jesus, right? Someone who Yeah, who you, the- you believe in Jesus. When you died, you believe you're going to be punished for all your sins. No, I believe Christ was punished for my sins. Right. I, I said yes to that substitutionary okay. atonement. Mm-hmm. So if someone doesn't believe in Jesus, they will be punished and annihilate, annihilated, but you could actually do worse sins than them, and you will not be punished, and you get to go to heaven. So just to reformulate here, you're talking about someone, say, in the modern era who has heard the gospel preached to them and they have rejected it. Right. They have said, no, I don't want any part of your God. Um, and somebody who uh, does end up accepting Christ, but has has committed worse sins than them in the past. Right. So as long as their repentance is true. Right. Then, yes, absolutely. Um, absolutely. What? Somebody who, who has committed worse sins in the past could end up being saved and someone who has committed. Okay. Sins let's let's, bad. Sure. let's okay. talk about unrepented sin. Like sometimes uh, I think you believe that okay. people sin and don't, are not mm-hmm. even aware of it. Right. That happens. Sure. Okay. So let's talk about unrepented sin. Let's say my number when I die is a hundred. Mm-hmm. And let's say your number as a Christian is 200. You're saying because you've believed a proposition that Jesus Christ died for your sins, mm-hmm. you will not be punished for your 200 unrepented sins, but I will be punished for my 100 repented, unrepented sins. Is that right? Let me, let me make sure we're on the same page here. Because using the word unrepented sins uh, changes the equation in a way, right? Because uh, I, and I think most Christians, do not believe that uh, in every single instance of, I mean, you can't possibly constantly repent for unintentional sin, right? I mean, if by definition it's unintentional, how do you know to stop and repent of it? So if Ignorance is no sin, excuse, I mean, says the Lord. <laughs> okay, so that's wildly out of context. You're quoting from Romans 1. You're quoting from Romans 1 in which Paul says that everybody knows that there is a God and they ought to be grateful, right? And uh, to those who who don't, they have no excuse. Yeah, that's what he's talking about. Okay, we'll we'll say even repent of sin then. We'll get rid of unrepentant sin. Let's say my sin number is 100 and yours is 200. Whether you repent or I repent or not, doesn't matter. That's your sin number. God keeps a list. He's checking it twice. And... But you're saying I'm being punished for 100 sins and you're getting no punishment for 200 sins. Is that correct? Did my life change after I accepted Christ or was I just 
the exact same. I'm guy. saying after you accepted Christ, your sin number was 200. My sin number was 100 as a non-Christian. And you're going to be not punished, and I will be punished. Is that your view? So the book of First John says that if anybody willingly continues in sin, right, uh, after receiving Christ, then they're they're not in it, right? And so if you're talking about, you know, uh, you do things here and there, you make bad decisions, you repent, you do that more often than the other guy, um, then yes, yeah, you still will be saved. If you're talking about somebody who says, oh, I said the sinner's I, prayer, I don't understand why you're talking about it. for the rest of my life, I ran around. The answer and, to my question, you know, I think, from your worldview should be, that's right, Doug. I can do more sins than you, and I will not be punished, but you will. That's the correct answer. So that's an oversimplified answer, because if we it have just makes it says, seem bad, no, no, I understand. Hear, hear, no, hear me out, hear me out. If somebody says, oh, I received Christ, and then they go around and kill a bunch of prostitutes every day, um, they, to our system of belief, no, you haven't. Uh, received Christ because receiving Christ does not mean you repeated a prayer. I'm not saying living in Christ. sin. I'm saying that you're. Okay, that's that's what yeah, I'm. Asking. I'm saying you're a Christian, but you sin more than I do. Okay, then sure. But you will go unpunished, and I will be punished, right? My punishment was taken by Christ. Yes. Right. Yeah. I don't know why Although, you didn't answer in, that. In this first life, place. there are still consequences, right? So, so when I do sin, it does break relationship in the here. And so now. really, you're a socialist because. You're basically Socialism you're basically getting something. System. You're basically my you, my family is communist because I'm a father and I have small children and from each according to his need, to each according to his uh, I'm from each according to his. Ability you're getting a free check in the mail. Need. I mean, no, no. I'm saying this is a this is not a way I would set up a government, but context matters. Where's your right? where's the more where's the personal responsibility when you don't get punished and I do? Well, like I said. Uh, first of all, there are temporal consequences. I'm talking about Second afterlife. All, afterlife. Uh, not everybody has the same experience in heaven. Not everybody has no, the but same honors. you don't get punished before condition. you go to heaven like I get punished before I go to hell. Yeah, that's grace. Right. Grace. That's socialism. Yeah. You're getting a free ride. There are some contexts in which I am okay with socialism, not as an economic system for the United States. You're a freeloader. That's irrelevant. Why don't you take responsibility for your sins instead of giving it to Jesus? Well, it's a pretty good deal, don't you think? Pretty good deal. <laughs> yeah. Free and, money. And it's foolish not to take it. <laughs> right? Well, but maybe it's immoral. to. If, if this is true, it's foolish not to take it. Maybe it's right? immoral to take it. Why is it immoral to receive a gift freely given from someone who has all the uh, all this kind of because thing. you're asking someone a God to take your sins and put it on himself They're your if sins I, not his if I take you if you and my brother who texted in earlier if we go to a burger joint and I say I'll pay for both your meals and he says sure sounds great and you don't and then you're mad at him the whole time because he didn't have to pay is that silly because I think it's silly no I, I'm saying that if you offered. if you do an action Mm -hmm. And it has a negative consequence. You should uh, take personal responsibility for it. But you, so you're saying you, you're if, taking if a free you, ride on it. So if you accept Christ, you get to spend eternity with Him. That said, and avoid punishment. What, what you, yeah, and avoid punishment. The experience that you have in heaven is not going to be the same for everybody. This is where we talk about the judgment seat. I know you're bringing but, this up three times, but it's already relevant because I'm talking about before you go to there heaven. There are different kinds of consequences. There's a negative reinforcement and there's a positive reinforcement. Uh, there's, a, there's a removing of consequence and there's a giving of benefit, right? So if we're talking operant conditioning, if we're talking about punishment reward, um, removing a reward is a consequence. And so for those who die in Christ, there is still consequence in terms of missed opportunity. Um, you know, you make mistakes, you don't, you don't get an additional word. Sure. But yes, you still get to spend your eternity with the Father because that is what you have chosen to do. You have said yes to Christ's substitutionary atonement and said, yes, I agree. I am signing on the dotted line. Take my sin. I'm turning around and I'm going to live uh, for you. And your Can family. you refresh one more time and then I'm going to talk to you about the resurrection if you don't mind?
Yeah, he gets less carrots. It's not a punishment, it's less reward. Not a punishment, but less reward. I hear you. But let's move on to the resurrection. Or let, can I ask you some speed round questions to figure out exactly what type of Christian you are? Sure. Do, and I, I apologize. I have about five minutes. Okay. Do you believe in the bodily resurrection of Jesus? Yeah. Do you believe um, that God, there was a literal Garden of Eden that uh, literal Adam and Eve were in? I'm undecided. Okay. Do you believe there was a global flood? I'm undecided. Do you believe there was a local flood? Uh, I mean, there have been a lot of local okay. floods, right? I mean, like that that relates to the Bible. In Genesis. Uh, it doesn't matter. I, I, I'm going to... So I'm undecided on a global flood. And if there's not a global flood, if, it's, if that is a metaphor, then no, I don't think it's based off of a local flood. Okay. Uh, why do you believe that Jesus... Um, rose from the grave for a lot of reasons um i believe historically i believe um in the supporting evidence uh from a historical pers and archaeological perspective i believe from an experiential uh perspective i believe from a philosophical perspective because i am looking for answers to life's greatest questions um i I think it's self-evident that there is some sort of divine, and so I'm looking for what uh, conception of God makes the most sense. So, uh, so what's the historical stuff? This doesn't sound like three more minutes of conversation, but um, well, you're I gonna find, you're, you're gonna be here longer than that because you're gonna love it. Um, I do have to go in a couple of minutes. I apologize. I do. Um, the historical evidence I find the. Uh, accuracy of the transmission of the Bible really incredible. Um, I find the uh, fulfillment of prophecy leading up. To I'm those just events. talking about one claim. Like for example, the, well, the claim that Jesus rose from the dead. Let's say the Bible. The Bible could be right about a lot of things, but that could still be false. Why do you believe that one claim? Well, if somebody is historically right a lot of the time. I'm more inclined to believe them, and that is part of the equation, right? So it is true that somebody can be telling the truth about one thing and not about another, but authority still matters. Okay, so let's say I'm I uh, I'm right now studying for my citizenship test in the United States, and let's say I hey, that's awesome. I get um, you know 95 percent of the test right mm -hmm. uh, on the historical claims, but then I tell you that uh, ten years ago my sister walked on water uh in my backyard pool mm -hmm. are you you would because of i'm pretty good so, at the other so stuff. what you're saying is those two realms of knowledge are irrelevant and that's your point correct i'm asking it's, it's, I, i'm asking you would you believe if i told you made a historical claim that my sister walked on water would you believe me i would be disinclined to believe right when paul says that jesus appeared to him do you believe him yeah why how is that different than my sister walking on water? Paul has a great deal more credibility than you. I just told you I'm 95% accurate on the history stuff. Yeah, on a U.S. history citizen. Let's say on all history stuff, I'm 95% accurate. So what I'm outlining is a system of prophecy with a lot of verified dates in a, in a system of religion. Why do you believe Paul? That mandates that prophecy needs to be accompanied by... Uh, signs so that we know that why it's do you true. believe that the Dead Sea Scrolls? I look at what happened. Why do you believe Paul? I believe Paul because Peter affirmed him. I believe uh, in in First Peter. Um, I believe Paul because I believe Luke's account in Acts. I believe Paul because of the miraculous nature of what happened in the church thereafter. I believe Paul because uh, he continued unfolding some of the most miraculous philosophical truths that fit in with the experience of man uh, and, and salvation and judgment and purpose. I believe him because it fits and because those who I also trust give him credence. Would you believe your own wife if she came to you one day and said, you're married, right? Yes. Yeah. And she said, uh, someone... I, I have to go on about a minute now okay. if I really do. She said to you that uh, someone that you both know, know has been dead for years and years and years, that she actually had a conversation with this person, ate with them, with him. Uh, she comes up to you and she's not joking. Would you believe your wife? 
do you think that all things are equally probable that no. because something happens once it has to be happen all the time? No, no. So we're talking about a singular, uh, nearly a singular. Would you believe your wife, if your rare. own wife, who you probably know uh, and trust the most of any other person on the world in the world, would you believe your wife? Uh, no, probably not. So but also there is not a large system of prophecy and a thousand years of, of I don't want to play whack-a-mole here. Predictions. Like, well, no, that's that's what I'm saying. You can't oversimplify this question, right? Something this but large. You, someone who you something... know, you slept with, you hug, you talk to, someone that is so intimate to you, you wouldn't believe a claim, but yet you believe a guy 2,000 years ago who you haven't talked to, who you haven't seen, you believe him. Do you believe that George Washington went across the Delaware? I mean, you don't know those guys. This is silly, right? Oh, okay. There, we have we have this is good. for believing these things. I really do have to go. I'm, I apologize. There's I a difference between to... crossing the Delaware and someone rising from the dead. Would you agree? Okay. Yes. Okay. So if your wife were to come home and say... Uh, Does, I, believe, I believe in the miraculous, right? And if you believe in the Big Bang, so do you. Okay, right. if you believe in the miraculous, you don't believe every miracle claim, though, do you? No, of course not, because miracles are by definition rare. Right. Mm -hmm. So what? What we're what I'm getting at is with your own I wife, all of the surrounding supporting evidence. So you take this thing out. You say, "Hey, this is this very unlikely thing. I'm going to take it out of this very specific set of circumstances in which we can be assured of its truth and put it somewhere where you can't be assured of its truth." Haha! -ha, you don't believe it. Well, of course not. I'm really sorry. I do have to okay. go. Thank you. Come so back next week. We'll talk about prophecy if you want. Take care. Appreciate See ya. It. See you, Wes. <laughs> Why does it crackle? Got to fix that somehow. By the way, if you're listening about... Um, well, of course you're listening because you're here. I hope you're listening. But the question about believing your own spouse is a good one because it shows very quickly that for certain claims, like someone rising from the dead, someone you know and trust the most on the planet you would not believe. And here you are believing Paul from 2,000 years ago. Really? But the Bible's special. It's special. Maybe, Andre. I say no to crack. Oh. Okay. Um, room's open. You can call in. But in the meantime, there was another question I asked that I asked Wes here today. I think it's the same question. Let's see. <laughs> and so Pine Creek asked this last thing, Tim. Isn't it a contradiction with 1 Peter 3, 9 to say that God actualized a world where he knew with certainty some would perish? Okay. Uh, I don't think so, because <laughs> the folks who God desires not to perish do not perish necessarily. So there's that word again. Yes. Uh, which really separates. Why are you saying Yes. God wishes none to perish. He created a world where he knew with certainty some would. Does not wish perishing. Wishes creation, knowing that perishing would happen. Not perish, perish. And just throwing the word necessity in there is not going to solve it. Because God could have chosen not to create. Um. The Molinist from the deterministic Calvinist. It's a necessity. Um, so let's uh, let's uh, yeah. First Peter three nine says that God loves all people and doesn't desire anyone to perish. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is a really tough verse uh, for the deterministic Calvinist to deal with. Uh, they really have to twist this passage of scripture uh, to keep their Calvinism. And I actually discussed this in my book. Um, but but Pine Creek seems to be wondering if the same problems come along for the ride with Molinism. It does. And I don't think they do. In fact, uh, on Molinism, God makes it logically possible uh, for people not to perish. 
God just knows that some folks... He makes it possible, yet knowing with 100% certainty that someone will not choose that option, and he created it anyhow. The best way to ensure that none will perish from God's point of view... How do I know? Because I've talked to God many times. I got him on speed dial. And I asked him, hey, God, if you want a 100% non-perishing rate... All you have to do is not create. You know what Yahweh told me? <laughs> You're right. Well, then why'd you create? Ah, I'm a bit of a schmuck. I said, okay, fair enough. You will freely choose to reject his love and grace, even though there's nothing that actually exists that deterministically prevents them from doing otherwise and experiencing God's love and grace. So in the same way, uh, sorry to do this again, but... I'm sure Dr. Strange desired Thanos to repent, but Strange just knew uh, that Thanos would not repent, but nothing but Thanos himself. If Strange, Dr. Strange knew Thanos wouldn't repent, guess what? Thanos is not going to repent. And if he does repent, then Strange knew wrong. Determined Thanos to not repent. Right, he was so could have Thanos repented? Could he have done otherwise? No, not if Dr. Strange knew with 100% certainty that he wouldn't repent. Thanks for the donation, Festering Boils. God also told man to be fruitful and multiply when he knew it meant more people would drown in the flood. Good point. <laughs> this is why open theism is probably better uh, to view the Old Testament. I want you to to multiply and, and fill the world with people. Even though someday I'm going to drown people and someday uh, most of them will go to hell. Thanks, Cheapback Dopra. There's a blue domino or a purple one. Uh, anyway, uh, I, I want to encourage, let me, let me say this to Pine Creek. Brother, I, I, I want to encourage you to stop resisting God's love and grace. In all... Tim, I want to encourage you to stop accepting God's love and grace because it doesn't exist. It's in your head. It's in your community. That's the love you're, you're feeling when you open up your Bible and when you, when you get that, the warm, fuzzy feeling. You're in love. You're feeling the love of, of an idea in your head. Seriously. Amen. Uh, God loves you, Pine Creek. More than God does not love me because this God does not exist. In order for me to be loved by something, it has to exist first. Right? That's just science. If, if, Tim, if God told me, the God I don't believe in, told me in this hypothetical that he doesn't love you because you're not his child. That's impossible, Doug. This is impossible hypothetical. Yeah, play along, okay? Just play along. If God told me that he does not love you, but you still feel the love of God every day, how would you explain that? Or most days? How would you explain that? If God told me he doesn't love you, yet you feel his warmth, his comfort, and his love and forgiveness every, on a daily basis, but he's cut you off, how would you know the difference? You still believe that he loves you, right? than you can possibly imagine. Uh, God created you, Pine Creek, on purpose and for the purpose. Uh, for the, he created you on purpose and for the specific purpose of a love relationship. Yeah. Allah, as a non-Trinity, loves you, Tim. Allah, the one God, where Jesus is not God, Allah loves you, Tim. He created you for a purpose, Tim. And yet you continue in your idolatry and accepting a man as God. You need to repent, Tim. I mean, the love, the majesty, the power, of Allah is waiting for you. It's not too late, Tim.
It's not too late to denounce Christianity and join Islam. Okay, Tim, now, now you, you might be laughing when you hear this, but you notice how there's no effect, that has no effect on you? Are you feeling that in yourself right now? Zero impact, right? Now you know how I feel. Zero impact. You know why? Because I don't believe any of it's true. The core propositions of it's true. I don't think it's true. Just like you don't think Islam is true, the core propositions. You might agree, agree with some of it. So please know that when you say stuff like this to a non-believer, you're being highly inefficient. There's some exceptions, though. I will say that what you're saying works for someone who's unhappy and desperate, who's maybe just gone through a bankruptcy, a divorce, a tragedy, a death in the family, who's going through severe existential angst. But guess what, Tim? That's not me. I'm just saying this to help you, Tim, that you realize that you're wasting your breath when you use this approach. It only works for the desperate. If you want to evangelize to me, you know how you do it? You pick me up in a car and we drive to a cemetery and you walk me in the cemetery and you see that person there, oh, died in 1846. See that person there, died in 1947. Watch this, Doug. Lord, help Doug's unbelieving heart. In the name of Jesus, I command these two people to rise from their graves in the name of Jesus. And it happens. Then I will look at you, Tim. I'll say, my whole worldview is shattered. I am no longer a naturalist. Now, i got to figure out which version of Christianity is true because you gave an incantation and it happened. That's how you evangelize to me. And until you do stuff like that, this whole love thing, Jesus loves you, he loves you, it has zero impact, Tim. you got to know this. You're not a young guy anymore. Through your life experience, you have to know this. That you're not even, my guess is you're not even saying this to me. You're saying this to the people watching you. Look how caring Tim is. I mean, Tim just cares for the unbelievers so much. Am I right? Is there a little bit of that going on? Am I being too harsh? I think I'm being too harsh. With the creator of the universe. And that is your objective purpose in life. That's the objective purpose of your existence. And the only thing hindering Pine Creek, the only thing hindering you from accomplishing your objective purpose in life is you, is Pine Creek. <laughs> so I, I say that to you, Pine Creek, not to argue. The only thing hindering you, Tim, from accepting Mormonism, the only thing hindering you for accepting and accepting the ways of the Buddha is you. ...with you or to start a debate with you, uh, my friend, uh, but simply uh, because I do love you and I want the best for you and I want you to experience God's awesome love and grace and there is nothing better. I'll just leave it at that. Amen. Dale, anything that you would like to add? Um, I guess um, I'll play the skeptic for a moment and just ask Tim, like, okay, let's say Pine Creek's, uh, first of all, we know Theist Thursday, this is going to be posted up, right? But uh, um, I, I'm just wondering if Pine Creek, it seems like what you almost are saying there, okay, so it is his choice kind of thing. Um, and presumably what he believes is up to him and his choice. So if somebody comes up and says, well, I don't believe we can control or choose our beliefs, um, how would you respond to that? Uh, that's a great question. Um, and so I, I don't 
advance the free believing argument. I yeah, have, I think Tim and I, we actually agree with each other here that we don't choose our beliefs. I don't think Tim cho believes that either, but we do choose the, you know, what places, what the choices that we make to, to put ourselves in situations to learn new things, which in the future will lead to belief revision. So I agree with him there. Okay, I'll, I'm willing to take more callers. We had Wes on. That was fun. You just, oh, I didn't even put the link on there, did I? My bad. The way you call in is to click the link on top. So I guess Wes got the link from his friend, his brother-in-law. I can tell some people are behind on the in the live stream. What is the objective purpose for anyone to glorify God and enjoy him forever? West needs to come on again sometime. Yeah, I think so. It's tough because he wants to preach. Wes, if you ever hear this, please know that um, you don't need to preach with me. Maybe you just want to preach to other people listening, but I probably know every the theological thing you want to say. Hello. Hello, peace, uh, Pine Creek, peace. I mentioned Islam and Allah, and I, and then you hop in, right? Well, yeah, I was, uh, I was thinking about um, the chap you had last week. You asked him to come back. You were grilling him on the age of Aisha, uh, but uh, oh yeah, that's right. Um, I, I don't know whether he's turned up. Maybe I can step in his shoes, perhaps if he's if he's not around. But yeah, uh, West uh, was West the. Uh, brother-in-law of no no um, that was an atheist wasn't he you once had a um, a christian who said his brother-in-law's an atheist grilling him and um i'm, I'm not quite sure whether he he might have been an well, that, atheist. that doesn't matter but yeah let's talk about aisha and nine-year-old coitus no 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 can I, can, yeah okay but can we talk about uh this issue first it was quite interesting um what west made a meal out of it actually christians often do um the, the Islamic view of of suffering and the purpose of this world, we don't believe God made us perfect, first of all. We believe that if um, God made, uh, if we were perfect, God would have scrapped us and But you have the exact same again. problems as the Christians, though. You you do believe God's okay, omniscient, yeah. right? Oh, yes, yes. yes. Yeah. And you, you wouldn't, um, you would say, I think that God... Allah hates disbelief. Um, the, the, the Bible uses the word God hates. We, the, the Quran never uses this word. God does not love. Okay. Yeah. God, but, Allah God, does not God, love. Our God does not hate. The Christian God hates. Our God, does, God not does not, Allah does not love, love. disbelief, right? Um, those, depends how you do, um, interpret it, those who hide the truth. This belief is hiding the truth. Right. He doesn't like that. No. But he created knowing that would it, that would it, um, happen. Yes. Yeah. Carry on. Yeah. And, and you, 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 that there is a you said that the Christians you quoted the the, uh, the a Bible verse which uh, West didn't like and tried to uh, skirt around it that most people will not be saved. Most people will be um, the in in the, the Islamic view is that. Um, although we do have Muslims who um, say most people will be sent to hell forever, uh, the, the there is there is hadith, um, authentic hadith where it, it does say that even Muslims will be sent to hellfire for certain for to be purified to be disciplined. What, what's your guess? What percentage of people on the planet will go to heaven, and what percentage will go to hell? Um, it seems there. Again, we can interpret things in a different way, but it seems by 
the interpretation of the of hadith that we have that uh, most people will come out of hell. Um, although you know there, there's an there's opposing we'll go views. to hell and then come out. Yeah, that they will be purified. They will be disciplined. So that we have we have that uh, we have we have that that uh, perspective. But uh, as I was saying, God didn't create this world. Um, if we if we were perfect in this world, there'd be no point in creating this world because, uh, well, this is my this is my view. But uh, what uh, all Muslims say is that if God had, because this is what we were told by the Prophet, if this world was perfect. God will scrap us and start off again with a creation that wasn't perfect because we need to make mistakes and we need to return to him. Uh, we need to make uh, the... Uh, yeah. yeah, it says that in the Quran, yeah. right? That Allah loves um, to forgive people. Well, even in Christianity, we, we, you know, we have opposing views, but some beautiful pa uh, passages in Christianity, uh, you know, if you return to God with a contrite heart, Right. It, um, so in a way, is, in a way, Allah likes sin because then He can forgive people when they repent. It is a teaching. It's a learning. It's a learning curve. Uh, what will occur in a perfect world? What's the use of? What will occur in a perfect world where there is no suffering, where there's no tribulations, where there there, is, there are no trials, where, where everyone's perfect? But Allah didn't have to create anything in the first place, right? Yeah, but he's the creator. Um, I know, but he didn't in, have to um, create, right? Well, it's, it's, it's one of his attributes. His attribute, we call him the creator. In Christianity, there are some who says, yes, it is an attribute. Well, wait a minute. It, is yeah. Allah free not to create? I don't know. It is, is an artist. It's what he does. An artist just loves creating. Okay. Would you would you say to an artist, don't create? But it, uh, if, if I understand. An, an, but an, we're talking about Allah here. Are you saying that Allah doesn't have free will in terms of creation? I don't know. Perhaps it's it's um, his passion. It's his attribute. It's, it's what he does. Uh, we can't strip an artist off his creativity. That would be that would just be wrong, wouldn't it? How can we strip God of his create? And I, I think there are some Christians who do, do accept that. Uh, this is an attribute of God. Others say it's an energy or, or what have you. Uh, I think a lot Christians of Muslims do. and a lot of Christians both are, feel very uncomfortable with saying God had to create. He couldn't have done otherwise. It, 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 it's, I did feel uncomfortable saying God doesn't have to do anything. But it, it is an attribute and therefore it is what he does. And uh, the Quran says he's the best of creators. Um, and uh, I suppose the, the garden at the end of life, the hereafter, the, is the perfect uh, world. And that is the that is the perfect creation. But what would be the benefit of that to uh, you if you haven't gone through tribulations? You you'd be arrogant. You you'd be a, a, the residents would be arrogant. They'd be uh, they think oh we did it uh, we deserved this. There was no uh, we would have been able to do it. Yeah, anyway. this is the Without, soul building theodicy, right? It's like uh, all... yeah, character building. Yeah. You, uh, like, you, uh, that this is why who you are you're you you you're sophisticated you're developed but Allah character. doesn't like murder he doesn't like rape he doesn't like gambling he doesn't like any of this right well neither do you uh, but uh, you are going you you will allow your children to go into a world one day where such things exist and you wouldn't True, chain but them we don't see the future you. You don't see this, you, but it's a possibility. Yeah, and you and you don't train your children indoors. And and we're selfish. Like I'm a father, but the reason why I had kids is to bring me hope, meaning, and purpose. I'm selfish. Allah's not selfish. He doesn't need people. He's a creator, and he and he uh, gave. Uh, we are told in the Quran that he gave. Even the even the mountains were asked, "Do you want the responsibility to, to, of this creation?" And it seems like uh, everyone said no except uh, humanity. Humanity before we existed, and we believe that uh, is uh, Allah responsible f for the murders that happen on the planet. Um, in a certain respect, you can say that because He allows us the opportunity to um, experience those things. But we also believe that once once you have um, it, once you have uh, it, it, once you've gone through the tribulations and you are in the garden all those things are just meaningless they they'll they'll mean uh, very little to you 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 won't even 
Well, I'm glad you I'm, gl I'm glad you admitted that Allah is responsible in some way for all the bad things that happen in the world. Well, that, in the same way as you are responsible, if anything untoward occurred to your children, you you allowed them to leave your house. Well, there's a difference between mm -hmm. me and your God in that I'm not omniscient. So let's say there's something I really, 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 really hate, and I know okay. with, and I know with 100 percent certainty my child would do that. There's a good chance I would not create them. Like, for example, if let's say I love my wife and I know the future and that if I create a son with my wife, that that son will grow up and kill my wife. Question, would I create that son? No. But yet this is what Allah does. He creates a world knowing that certain things will happen that he hates, hates, hates. And yet he says, OK, I'll do it anyhow. Yeah, but you but uh, you say to, you know, for certain your son will do this but your son says to you i will not trust me you and uh, are you going to say uh, are you going to uh, if i'm god you going to say, say no? you're a schmuck you, you don't know <laughs> okay then it this is this is part of uh, life is it's the world we live in it's uh and um, um there is no um um even even the philosopher like one of, one of you the greatest atheist um, philosophers ever nietzsche he claims that man is composed of uh, you know he's, he's composed of a, a body and a can we a talk about soul. aisha now Please. yeah hold on but the mind is, the mind is meant to fashion beauty out of suffering of the body even your atheist philosophers understood this there is there, there can be no beauty without suffering those who enter those okay, who okay, enter okay. paradise you're will preaching, be beautiful you're preaching. Uh, that's enough i mean uh, well what, what Nietzsche preaching he's an atheist he's, 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 well, i'm preaching what the atheist the, the greatest atheist who probably i, I ever like lived. short questions short answers i and if if you yeah, don't like that you don't have to stay but um you spent uh, ages with west i've given you a shorter answer i, I said the same thing to him no you're talking as long as he did sometimes even longer but um uh, oh, no, no. do you believe not, um, muhammad had slaves um, he did, yes. Do you believe Muhammad had sex with a nine-year-old? Um, he married... No, uh, th there are... Do you believe he had sex there, with a nine-year-old? You lean yes, lean no. I can... I, um, I, I, they say he married a, a nine-year-old. Uh, I, mean, I think she was six when he married her, right? There is no... Do you believe in... Do you believe in uh, fallacies? Yeah. Yes. You, you believe you 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 believe in the fallacy of presentism. Do you believe in the fallacy of incomplete comparisons? In the fallacy of psycho psychology? Why won't you answer my question? Like it's a belief question. It, it doesn't matter if you're right or wrong. Do you believe personally believe that Muhammad had sex with a nine year old? I found it hard to be the, to accept the uh, the uh, time timeline. But let's say yes. Okay. I don't, you do. Uh, you lean yes. No, no, don't, don't, why are you saying sex? That is your psychologist fallacy. That's your moralism fallacy. You, you become a, 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 a this is I'll fallacious moralism. You can say no. I'll ask again. Do you, you believe Muhammad married? had sex with a nine-year-old? You can say yes. You can say no. Or you can say I don't know. No, the way you frame it is is terrible. You're, it's moralizing. There wasn't. There is arbitrary. The age. Uh, I'm going to say no because in uh, Islam, um, age of for marriage is arbitrary. There is no age. I'm not talking marriage. about marriage. Um, well, in a biblical sense, you can't I am. have sex without marriage. You cannot. You cannot have sex without marriage. Okay. So you, I think you first you said yes, but now you say no. Yeah, but you, also you you have left the issue of slavery. This I'm is just asking yes or no questions right now. I asked you, do uh, you believe? Can uh, we get back to slavery? Will we be allowed to get back to slavery? I asked you if if you believe Muhammad had slaves. You said yes. Then I asked you, did, did, do you believe that Muhammad had sex with a nine year old? Then you talked no, for then. like I two don't. minutes, and then you I, finally I said no. No one, no one believes the age is important. The age is not important. The age, the age is not important when it comes to sex. No. What do you mean, sex? You can't have sex without marriage. Marriage, same marriage. Don't say. Is sex. it okay to marry yeah. a nine year old and have sex with a nine year old? It's not. In your view? It's not all right to. It's not right to have sex with a nine year old. No. How about, is it? Right, not is it okay right. to marry a nine year old and have sex with her? In your view. No. No, age is irrelevant. Age is age is arbitrary. If age it's irrelevant, then why did you say no? It's not right. 
because get rid of the age. The age is nonsense. Get rid of the age. Do you think it's which is worse to have to get married to a woman and have sex with her at age 21? She's 21 and you're 21 or to get married to a girl who's nine and have sex with her and you're 21 and she's nine. Which is worse? In your very in this in this moralistic in in our morals today and no and no Muslim country on record today permits it. So ask your question: Why not? Stop using the stop using this age thing. Um, it, the, age the past, doesn't matter. Like, are you for pedophilia? Pedophilia. What, oh, so what, what does pedophilia mean? Tell me. Sorry. Give me the definition. Are you for people getting married at any age? And having sex I'm at not, any I'm age. Not, I am not in favor of ped pedophilia, no. What does pedophilia mean? Forget pedophilia, because I know it's just going to dis distract. But are you for getting married at any age and having sex as a married couple at any age? No. Islam is not um, in favor of... Uh, okay. Well, um, ma ma marriage in terms of a, a contract. In the past, there were, there were contracts um, signed... Uh, before marriage. So what age, are, what age would you say it becomes wrong to get married? You tell place? me age. Okay. I'll, I'll tell you, I'll tell you the rules. If you're willing to listen to the rules, the principle of marriage, I'll tell you them. I just worried but, about, but, I'm just talking about age right now. You're just interested in age. And I'm telling you, age is irrelevant. Age is arbitrary. If it's age irrelevant, just, then why did you say it's wrong to get married at any age and, and have sex at any age? You should have said, Oh, it's okay. If it's if it's irrelevant, it is not. It's not okay to have sex at any age at all. Marriage is a different matter. Marriage a contract can be signed before before um, a one comes of age. I asked you if it's okay to get married at any age, and then have sex at any age, and you said no, right? You can't have sex at any age. Now, getting now marriage that there, there is, uh, you think marriage is marriage and sex? It's it's not like that. In in the past, it wasn't like that. There was there were contracts signed for marriage. That's a promise. There were different types of marriages. I know, I know. I'm no. just talking about a penis going into a vagina. Do you... well, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about I something. I am though, and I'm asking you. No, no. All, all do that you is wrong. Do you believe and... Muhammad's penis went in <laughs> Aisha's vagina at the age of nine? Age of nine is irrelevant. Do there you was... believe Muhammad's penis went into Aisha's vagina at the age of nine? Yes or no? I don't, but I'm telling you, that's not art. Uh, that's not. You don't what, believe it. I, I don't believe it because there are some discrepancies in age, but there are some Muslims okay, okay, who do believe fine. it. Okay, there's some Muslims who believe it, but you don't. Let, okay. me let me let me defend those who let me defend those who say that. No, no. So if if you don't believe that Muhammad's penis went in Aisha's vagina at age nine, what age do you think it did happen? I don't know. Now so they say it was nine year old. Uh, the, the there are other scholars. There are scholars, minority okay, views that know. says it was at another age. Okay, you don't um, know. So now let me ask you the next question: If it were true, if it were true that Muhammad did put his penis in Aisha's vagina at age nine. Would that lower your view of Muhammad? Um, for in, in present in the present day, um, we, we we can't. The, Would that the lower truth, your view of Muhammad if it, if that were true? Um, these are not yes or no questions. These are not yes. Or no. If if he lived today, he wouldn't. He definitely would not have accepted done that. It was. It is a no question. Our minds cannot. This fathom. is a hypothetical thought experiment. I understand you don't believe that Muhammad did that, but I'm asking you: <laughs> if Muhammad or any person had sex with a nine-year-old, would that lower your view of them as in married, world, as yeah. a married couple? In today's world, yes. In today's world, yes. In those days, it wasn't an issue, and I think you know that. Okay. You are being. This is the fallacy so of moralism. So today, of so today you say it would lower your view of a, of me, let's say, if I did that. But back then, you it wouldn't lower your view? It, it lowered nobody's view until uh, the, the year 1900. I'm talking about Nobody you today. When you look back at people in the year 600 
and they do, I do and they have sex with nine year olds. My, I, I, you are you are committing so many logical fallacies. It's unbelievable. Today, people have uh, opportunities in in uh, life life expectancy is is longer. They go to school. There's a they play with toy. Childhood is now a term that's accepted. We be, we accept this idea of childhood of of a later de later development in those in those days until 1900 these were these weren't things that anyone thought about you got married when when you were um uh when you went into puberty i understand that there's cultural that, differences that was the age of marriage. i understand so that, that, i understand that, there's cultural differences from now to back then i believe morality evolves and that we're way better off we're way better now than we were back then but my question is if you were to compare our morality today of not having gay married at nine and having sex at nine compared to what they did back then which do you think is better the way we do it today or the way they did it back then who does it today you you in america or in spain or where they can get married at 12 or 14 or whatever the age is who who's got it better who's nine. got it right i'm talking about the age of nine and that what what, what is arbitrary it's arbitrary. The age is arbitrary. What matters is the, are the principles. Are you, as an individual, ready for marriage, ready for sex? If, if you These were God and you could make rules, even in the year 600, would you have said, hey, you know what? Nine-year-olds are not quite developed yet. Um, no don't get married, not... don't have sex. Would you be for that or against that? No one had an age. People didn't even know their ages on, in those days. It, <laughs> do you think... Do you think even do you think in 1850s people worried about age? They didn't that know their ages what, in the year 600. Of course, of course not. Not in, even in, in the 1900s, people One, didn't know their two, ages. Two, three. You can count, count to nine. You obviously, uh, you are um, uh, uh, your your sect of Christianity. You, you, um, I understand people, that um, some people we didn't have birth certificates and stuff. I get that, but they, not, they knew roughly how old not. they were. They they knew roughly, but uh, they didn't know specifically. Age, age was not the issue. The, um, the, the principles in Islam is if there's no harm caused or no harm given to you okay. or no harm okay, given to you. Okay, you wanted to then. get back to slavery. So what do you want to say about slavery? Okay, but can I just go to two more? Just that there are four principles in marriage. There's no harm. There no... I really just want to get to slavery now. Okay, so, so that's the only two more. Society is... And the people are psychologically able and uh, physically able. That's what marriage is. It's not age. Age is age is not the issue. And that and those principles will allow all societies everywhere. Do you have daughters? Sorry. I would not allow my daughters to get married at nine. Or definitely not. Why and, not? Uh, Why it, not? It, it, even the age even is the arbitrary. Problem. It's irrelevant. It's arbitrary. They're not ready. They're not ready They're because not ready. society. Yeah, I'll tell you why. Because of the, the four the four principles that physically no, um, psychologically they're not ready. Um, society doesn't allow it, and um, uh, harm um, it, it could harm them psychologically in this world in in the world right. we have today. Three of those four it. apply to the year six hundred. Of course they did. Of course they did. Yeah. If, if, and yet and Muhammad society, did it, right? And because the society allowed it, there was no physical harm. She, uh, she was mature. She, she was uh, in puberty. That, this, this is what uh, this is what the issue is. And if nobody. You, if your daughter was in and puberty, you, and you, Pine Creek, if you, you Pine Creek have, have uh, if your daughter was in puberty at the age of nine, would you allow me to marry her and have sex with her? If, if they are physically and psychologically, psychologically today, no one is ready for marriage at nine. Their life oh, but back then, back then they were ready. We're living in the desert. Uh, what were you going to do as a, as a as a as a woman in the South in Arabia at, in at nine years old, or or when you're when you became a pubescent? So you, what were you going to do? You, you were going to get married. Everyone would get married. <laughs> so you get married at nine because of boredom. No, because your life expectancies were were, were less. You you would. Um, um, your tribe would need um, to have children to defend defend themselves. You would have to help the family in work. That was how life is. Think about how life was. What did you think she was going to go to the University of uh, 
of of a jeddah or somewhere we should go into go on her uh, jet airplane to visit the world and uh, tour oh you can talk you can talk and talk and talk You want to talk about slavery yet? Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, the Prophet Muhammad had slaves, he said, and all Muslims can tell you that this is what uh, we believe. If you have a slave, you feed them first and you clothe them with what you have. And if you hit them, you let them, you free them. Also, but by the end of his life, he had no slaves. You can check this out for yourself. Don't take my word for it. So if we as Muslims... Why did he have um, no slaves at the end of his life? Yeah, he freed them all. Why, so, did, well, hang on. Why did he free them? Because that, that was uh, because the Quran says the way of the, do you want to know what the good is? The good is to free a neck. Oh, so it's and good is, to free slaves. The Quran says, do you want to know what good is? Okay. To, now it hang is on. To free a neck. If it's good not to have slaves, if it's good to free them, Muhammad yeah. had slaves that was bad then, yeah. right? That's just logic. Again, we are, we are, <laughs> you're being a psychologist, you're being a historian, you're living in the present world, blah, blah, no, blah. No, I'm, li I'm in that world. You said when Muhammad yeah. died, he had no slaves because he freed them. And I asked, why he did he free them? And you said, because it was good to free slaves. So if it's good to free it's, slaves, then that yeah. means it's bad to, to enslave slaves, right? Definitely. And the character of the prophet, when he had, when so he Muhammad did have was slaves, was a bad guy to have slaves then, right? According to your own logic. Well, you tell, you tell me, you tell me he was a bad guy. People had slaves; they would beat them. He never beat his slave. He would treat his slave, his slaves, uh, in the in in a very good way. He said, "Feed them what you eat, clothe them what you wear. If you treat them badly, then free them." Everyone had slaves then, um, and uh, you were either a slave or a slave owner. There might have been a class in between. That was his character before Islam. The Quran came, and in the Quran it says, do you want to know what the good road is? To free a neck. By the time he died, oh. he freed any How slave How old was he had. Muhammad when he had his visions and became Muslim? 14. 14. So what, how old was he when he 14. died? 63. So from the ages of 14 to, let's say, 60, he had slaves. And then by the time he was 63, he died. And then he had no slaves. Yeah, and uh, his, his character, he was known as a trusted one. He's no, he was known as a generous person. Yeah, yeah, People yeah, yeah, yeah. A nice guy. I get okay. it. But, <laughs> but for most of his life, he had slaves. And it's good to free slaves, but yet he didn't do what it was good. So he didn't do it. He, he, when, there, when he had slaves, when... When uh, you could either be his slave or someone else's slave who beat the guy, beat, beat the person, he would have slaves and would, he would uh, show everyone in his community uh, how to treat... Was he 40 or 14 when he, got, when he became Muslim? 40, no, 40, sorry. 40. Oh, okay, I heard, I heard you say 14. But still, from, from 40 to 63, it's he, a big chunk of that, he had slaves, yet it's good to free slaves, but... Um, servants to the family. Do they have, the what if they want rather die? Would, would uh, Muslims honor their wish and kill them? Um, yeah, that, well, perhaps that they could let them go and run into the desert where they'll get, they'll, they'll die of thirst and uh, heat stroke and uh, be uh, available to any bandit who wanted to take them and sell them again. Yeah, but some, so, but if some it. people might prefer death over living with their enemies. Well, if you are living with the, well, maybe so, but if you're living with the prophet, he showed everyone how to treat their slaves. As I said for the fourth time, feed them what you eat. Don't burden them with, uh, overburden with, with, with work. Clothe them with what you work. And if you beat them, you have to free them. That was his, that was his uh, way. And by the end of the life, he's well, free. How do you free motivate them. a slave if you can't beat them? But you feed them and you clothe them. Oh, you withhold you, food from them if they don't do what you say. Like, let's say you have a slave back then. What do you mean? You feed them. What, if you've got a slave, no, you no, no. feed them. I know, I know. But so, listen to what I'm saying. Yeah. If you had a slave back then and the, and you tell them, okay, can you go uh, plow this field or whatever? And they say, no. 
what do you do? Um, I'm, 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 I don't know. I, I, I haven't. Uh, you need to think about uh, that. Yeah. You know why? Because if a slave has nowhere, they, if they're at the bottom, if they're owned as property, yeah. how do yeah. you motivate it, it, them other than to beat them? Well, you, or starve you could, them. You, you could tell them if you don't, if you don't help grow the food, you can't eat the food. In in a right. in a subsist in a subsistence, you got to threaten them society. with death and starvation, and and in a subsistence society, in a subsistence society where everyone has has to chip in, and you don't. I suppose you you, you won't be able to um, get the reward of uh, the community yeah, the community uh, effort. So it's a it's you you become part of the community, you become you you are given the rights of the community. If you if you don't I know want to help, the I know what Muhammad did to motivate his slaves. He sat down with them calmly and said, "Look, I know you you can't do what you want and you walk around freely and and just you know go to a neighboring city, whatever, and you're stuck here. But you know, if you just think of it from my point of view, we really need you to participate. So I I just want you to gather up your courage and and gather up your motivation and please do what I tell you." Is that how he did it? No. In Islam, we have we believe in contracts. You are you are a prisoner of war. A letter is sent to your family to ransom you. If if, if no ransom comes, a contract is made with the with the uh, captive. You will work for so and so family, and you will be provi provi provided for. But do you accept the contract? You can accept the contract, and if you don't, I'm not sure exactly what happened. Yeah, Maybe you need was, to look yeah. into that. If they don't accept the contract, you die, right? I, su I, su I suppose that's it. That, that's that's probably why everyone would accept such an offer. You're a, you're a prisoner of war. You know, they oh, know no, that. No, no, no. I bet you a huge percentage. I don't know what it is, but I bet you a huge percentage said, "No, I decline the contract. Kill me, because you just killed my husband. I well, watched I you stick a sword in my husband's heart, and now you expect me to clean your dishes." Well, actually, uh, that was part of that was ex an accepted part of war in those days. Women would actually uh, follow their husbands into war in caravans, dressed up in their best, perfumed, so that if their husbands would die, they they would be taken. Uh, they would be taken and uh, by um, the other side uh, as as captives. That, that, uh, sadly, that's how it was. So, who's um, who's a better guy, me or Muhammad? What would you have done? No, no. What me today. Me today oh, versus yeah. Muhammad in the year oh, 600. Yeah. Are you being attacked? Are you? Are, are people threatening to kill you? Not yet, but maybe after this live stream. <laughs> maybe, maybe it's the opposite. I feel like you maybe maybe you put me on the spot. Anyway, look, because you are, I've never you are... married a nine-year-old and had sex with a nine-year-old and i've it, never had slaves I mean, muslims don't do that it's not nine you get rid of it's arbitrary society Who's sets better it. me in the year 2022 or muhammad in the year 600 of course, of course you of course because no one ever no one ever thought about me? criticizing i'm being sarcastic you of course because not even not that you haven't not that you haven't done done that no one has ever thought ever thought of criticizing for Muhammad for doing that until you said it right now. In fact, it was in 1900. No one has ever, no one ever criticized Muhammad. They would criticize him for everything. And the Christians really criticized Muhammad for so many things. But it was only until 1900 that this issue was brought up. It wasn't an issue in, in the past. Which issue, the slavery or the, or the sex? Yeah, the the uh, uh, the consummation of, of the age of consummation. It wasn't an issue until the 1900. So you, well done, you. You are the best man in history because you are the like you are one of the first people who pointed this out to us. So <laughs> this just tells me that this is just a uh, a fallacy, a logical no, no, fallacy. Here's the problem. Here's the problem with this. The reason why people like me bring it up is because if Allah is the objective grounding of truth and morality and he was silent in the year 600 about getting married to nine-year-olds, having sex with nine-year-olds or whatever age it was, 
and owning people as property, if he was silent when he could have very easily said, don't do these things, um, that is a defeater to Islam because you yourself would admit to me, I think, that the way we do it now is better. You don't want your daughter getting married at nine and, and having sex at nine. You don't want me to own you as a slave, right? Or vice versa. Are you saying the way you do it now in your particular state in America or the way they do it in Spain or the way they do it in... The way we do it now, I'm telling you, age is arbitrary all throughout the world and all throughout history. But the age of the society you live in sets the standard, and that is the Muslim way. I agree. In fact, in, in fact, the Quran tells us this. It says, when the people, when the people, when see you of an but, age, when you're ready, that but is you when just you're said it. You just said it. And I, when I said I agree, you said it's society that sets the standard. But my point is, this is a defeater to Islam because Allah ought to have set the standard, not society. Allah does set the standard in the Quran. He said, when you see that they are of age, then that's the age of marriage. Right. So, so that, that, that is the Sharia. That is the, the standard. Each society can set it, and Allah gives permission for you to set it. So, do you think the standards age, we have? Age is not an issue. In fact, no. In, in fact, the Bible. Do you think the standards that we have set as a society today of, um not allowing nine-year-olds to get married and have sex, even if they've hit puberty, sometimes a nine-year-old hits puberty. But I think it's illegal in most Western societies. Do you agree with that standard or do you think we should go with Allah's standard? I'm not muted, am I? Um, it's, it's illegal in most Muslim countries because society has changed and the Quran tells us Right, but it has, a, set. has society done a good thing? It does because society has changed. The sherry, the the, okay. the rulings change according to time. In those days, but it wasn't good there back was then. No, well, what, what was what were you going to do when you reached puberty? You were going to get married. If you weren't going to get married to Muhammad, you were going to get married to someone else. You reached puberty. You don't even understand that. Well, you could you get, get an get education, married. learn things. What first. education? She was going to go to the University of uh, the Sand, Sand Dunes. Oh, yeah. Where they didn't, didn't have university for girls back then. They didn't they? even read or write. There was no reading. They were illiterate society. Right. So Allah, Allah could have said, you know what? Instead of getting married at age 9, 10, 11, 12, here, uh, Muslims, hear ye, hear ye. This is Allah, the creator God, talking. Please, children, go learn from teachers. Set up schools. Set up teachers. Even set up a democracy where you can vote and we can have, uh, uh, you could set up uh, hospitals next to the schools. Have your mind developed first before you make a lifelong decision of marriage. Yeah. One of the first universities was in Muslim countries and also the first hospitals. And also the first word revealed to the Prophet Muhammad was read. Read, it said. In, in the Bible, we have in the beginning. In, in the, the Quran, the first word revealed oh, was read. So it was, and the prophet, young and the prophet girls, young boys them. at the age of 9, 10, 11 should have gone to school instead of getting married. They did both. They had to do both. It was a subsistence society. You died if you didn't. Well, you just the, said, the, the, you just said that what else are they going to do? They have to get married. Okay, thanks, Eats Eating. Uh. <laughs> My goodness I need to I need to play something here How about this one I came in like a Okay, I feel better now. Christopher. 
Hey, Christopher. Hey, Pine Creek. I saw uh, you. I saw you try to call. Time. I saw you try to call in the other day on the Pine Creek Politics channel. Oh yeah, I'll I'll say that for next time. I'm here to make fun of Jesus. <laughs> not, not Allah. <laughs> um. Well, that was that was crazy too. Um, I I just think uh, I know this is this Thursday, so it won't take up too much time. But it's crazy how much uh, like extra biblical stuff you have to know in order to really understand God. Um, yep, it doesn't make it too easy for people. I don't understand how they don't see that as a huge weakness. Yeah, I agree. Especially if you leave the belief, you got to be super knowledgeable. Right. And um, I, if people are judged by their knowledge that's available at the time, but knowledge just keeps coming that, that adds to the weight of their arguments, then there's really no end to where people can be judged. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. If there's all these new ideas that are continually coming out that, that add to the beliefs. Like what's a, what's a person in, you know, 600 AD supposed to do when they don't have the quantum collapse theory <laughs> and therefore they don't believe in God. Ah, uh, yes. When Wes was on, for those of you who came late and we had Christian on, uh, he was trying to explain free will versus determination, determinism. And he had to bring up the quantum uh, collapse. I mean, quantum wave collapse. Yeah, it's silliness. 500 years yeah. ago, he couldn't use that argument. Actually, 100 years ago. But anyhow, I'm going to leave the, uh, the room open for Theus. Is that all right? Yeah, that's fine. Good talking to you. See ya. Room's open. I actually think it's both Islam and Christianity. They hear conversations like I just had with Wes and with um, Eats Eating. It just won't. I can sort of understand while there's still, there'll always be general theists in the world, give people comfort, help allay the fear of death. But specific religions, they're all, they're all going to go down so so fast. Oh, I know who this is. Elias. Elias. Do you hear me? Yeah, I hear you. Loud and clear? Yep. Okay, so. Uh, let me just uh, <laughs> untangle all this mess of a conversation you had, okay? Okay. Real quick. Untangle. First question. First question. Uh, when you talked about like why did uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had to create everything okay the correct Islamic answer will always be appealed to mystery right we don't know because it really literally says in the Quran the angels ask this question like why are you doing this why are you putting uh, humans on earth the answer that Allah gave was uh, I know something that you don't know pretty much appeal to mystery so anybody who says otherwise so when you ask this question again to Muslims know that there, there is no answer for some that, muslims right? have answered that way to me what you just said this is correct answer this is the only correct answer anybody who doesn't give you this answer prepare for like one hour of wolfing so just be prepared but, for but the problem okay? the problem is if you say i don't know why allah created it's a mystery but there's still the the, the my main critique and that is allah created knowing that it would lead to something he he hates Again, we, we don't know that. We don't know. Maybe there is a purpose. Well, they, we know that there is a purpose. We just don't know what the purpose is. Well, it doesn't say in the Quran that Allah hates disbelief? The word hate is really not used, but yes, it not is love. the correct traditional Islamic belief that, yes, he hates yeah. disbelief. So He hates, yes, this is hate. Allah created, when he didn't have to, something he hates. Okay, so hate is just a... Uh, 
punishment that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dispensates at the particular people and the particular time and space. That's it. Hate is not like uh, like human hate, you know, when you If Allah the didn't table. create, then he wouldn't have things that he would look at on earth and say he hates. Again, hate is not what you believe hate is. Again, this is hatred of Allah towards someone. It's just a punishment, right? That he will dispensate. Right. If Allah That's didn't it. create, there'd be no one to punish. Okay. And your point is, how is punishing people bad? How is punishing Hitler bad? Does Allah enjoy punishing people? Well, this is justice. This is an attribute of his justice. He enjoys. I don't know what enjoy is. It's just what it is, right? It's just what he does. But he would he right? rather his, reward his people or punish them? He rather be just to people. Right, but he does, some people. He doesn't want people to sin, right? He created us with a infallible. We were created infallible. But does Allah want so, people to sin? Yes or no? He wants us to be infallible, right? I don't know what want is when you're talking about does he God, desire want, it? I I cannot answer this. Like does does Allah desire it. you to commit murder tomorrow? Desire me? No. No, not. he doesn't want it. But yet Allah knows that every murderer out there who's about to murder tomorrow, he knows that's going to happen, right? Yes, of course he knows yeah. everything. And he created, even when he first created, he knew that would happen, right? Yes, this is the purpose of creation, creating humans. We are not created perfect, we are created fallible. So he created a world, knowing with 100% certainty that some people would sin and murder, and he said, okay, I see that happening, I'm going to do it anyhow. Yes, and the purpose for this is unknown, but there is. There is a purpose for this. Ah. You just don't know. It's just like, you know, uh, you, you know that there is a capital of Australia. You just don't know what it is, right? But it, there, there is capital. We, we know this, right? We just don't, we don't have this information that it's Canberra and not Sydney. But do you blame right? Allah for the, the murder? No, of course not. Even though he could have prevented it? He could prevent uh, uh, everything he wants, yeah. What if, but, but, what if I murdered one of your loved ones, someone you really care about, and you come up to me and you say, Doug, why did you do that? And I said, for reasons, but I'm not going to tell you. I did it for morally sufficient reasons. And if you, I'm not going to tell you. If you don't like it, just suck it up. I, I don't care about your reasoning. I, I, I'd want justice to be done. I, but what if... What if my reasons are good? What if, let's say, I killed one of your loved ones because I knew they had a bomb that would kill a thousand other people? Well, that, that wouldn't be a murder, right? Well, but only I know that, nobody else in the world. So I get convicted for murder, I get put in jail for murder, but I, I rest easy in the sense that I had morally sufficient reasons. Well, you do what you do, the Sharia will do what it does, right? So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but the point being is, there is a purpose. We don't know the purpose. Okay, that, that's the correct answer. So many mysteries. So the, the next topic. Uh, uh, oh, Aisha, wait, let's wait, talk wait. about that. Okay, let, let, let's talk about that. So, uh, what's the what's the age of marriage? Uh, correct age of marriage according to you? To me? To me. I don't. To, to, what do you believe the age of marriage should be? Uh, over twenty, but twenty eight is probably good. When your prefrontal cort cortex is fully developed. So when you are 27 years old and 364 days, this is not okay, right? But one day passed? No, no, okay. it's a spectrum. I admit that. I admitted that to the other guy too. So what's the correct age? Like, the given but I think, I think we can look at tales of the distribution and say that, that we shouldn't go there. Like, for example... Nine, I think you and I are both agreed, is too young to get married and have children. Depends on the situation. Well, have children, uh, maybe. But marriage, um, well, the correct Islamic view, the correct Islamic view, you can, you can marry at any age, right? Out of the womb. Right, right, right. Absolutely. But I, I'm talking about, like, I'm talking about getting married and then having sex. Consummation. Consummation yeah. can be done only when there is no harm to the both parties okay, okay? And so do you, the, do you think it's no more harm, do you think there's more likely to be harmed done to a nine-year-old than let's say a 20-year-old 
it, it, it depends on, on humans. Some humans I are know. fragile even. I know. I agree with you. It depends. But the thing is, we've got a distribution curve of harm done to, let's say, females having coitus. Well, this is on, on Can't the we say there's harm done to a baby? Yes. How about one-year-old? Yes. Two. Yes. Three. Yes. I think nine is still there. It depends on, on, on the disagree? person. Of course, I disagree. It depends on a person. And the decision for that is, is on the parents and on the Are you a parent? parties, husband and wife. Uh, what? Are you a parent? Uh, no, I'm not a parent. Okay, imagine you had a daughter that was nine. Would you let me marry her and have sex with her? It it depends on the situation. Let's say she's it hit puberty already, which is very, Again, very rare at nine, but I'll, I'll grant it. Well, you, you are not a Muslim, so the answer is no for, for that. If I was a Muslim, would I? Would you allow me to marry your daughter and have sex with her at age nine? Again, this this decision belongs to me, right? Right, so I'm asking if, if you. I say yes, if I say yes, well, to, to you, no. If, if you're like really super mega good muslim and there are no other good muslims of the <laughs> so you would let me have sex with your nine-year-old daughter if i was a super mega good muslim and there were no other available options right? and there was no other options there may be someone like 18 year old or something 15 year old yeah obviously yes oh so 18 is better than nine well there is a hadith that the ages should be uh, well, closer to each other, husband. Why is eighteen closer. better than nine? Oh, because because you, you cannot reproduce. You are you are too old right now, right? How old was Muhammad when he married Aisha? Fifty-two, but uh, almost no, fifty-three. I don't remember. But uh, he was my age, 50s, early fifty. So this is a good comparison. Ah, uh, but it was done to foster closer ties with Abu Bakr. And Bakr. how old was Muhammad when he consummated the marriage? Uh, early 50s uh, as well and how old was but Aisha? Was nine so a 52 year old had sex with a nine year old yes and uh on your morality scale is that like okay not okay i already told you you can marry at any age and you can consummate marriage when there is no harm for you this is the morality scale okay marry any age okay so you're okay age. so if i was to do that today you're, you're okay with that if you meet the conditions if i approve yes wow but it's it's for, for all time. i hate to be what, your daughter what, what he said that it changes law changes somehow when the time passes bullshit okay it does not it stays the same could you i married? have said no could i have said no uh, I don't think so. It's, it's consent was for her parents, but if she reached puberty, yeah, she could. She could so in to your morality system, it's okay to force a woman, a girl. Oh no, it's not a force. Uh, her parents gave consent. No, but the, what's let's say Aisha or any girl said no. I don't want to get married. Well, she can divorce. There is divorce in, in Islam. No, no, I don't want to get married. If you don't get married, you can't get divorced. Is that legal in an Yeah, Islam? yeah, of course, it's legal. Yeah, yeah, you can you can divorce. You can say, no, no. I, I don't want to. Is it legal for a nine-year-old to look at her parents and say, mommy, daddy, I don't want to marry that old guy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Divorce is okay. She can decline, yeah. She can decline? Yeah. You sure? Yes, when she reaches puberty, when she can uh, make so decisions. So Aisha could yes. have said, no, I don't want to marry Muhammad, and everything would have been fine. Yes, yes. So you're saying that a nine-year-old has the mental capabilities to say, I want to spend the rest of my life with this person. Oh, nine-year-old, yes, but a six-year-old, uh, I don't know. It's still parents, parents decide. But parents have like the best. Oh, so you draw the line at six. Yeah, she got huh? married at six, right? She got married at six, yes, could consummate at nine. And you just said that she might not have the mental ca capacity to make that decision at age six. Well, again, we are assuming, but uh, listen to this. Listen to this. Did Aisha, she lives for like uh, in, in the mid-60s. Did she have problems with that marriage? No. Did her parents have problems with it? No. They proposed it and helped to organize it. Uh, did Prophet uh, Alex have problems with it? No. Did society have problems with it? 
No. Did his enemies have problems with it? No. Now the question is, then why do you have problems with it? Oh, because I I think morality evolves, and the way we do it now is better than back then. No, no. I believe that morality evolves. Okay. Right now, you guys can't even figure out what gender you are. So, uh, we don't need lectures I... about morality from Westerners. Well, you're t talking the wrong guy if you're, because I I'm probably on the same page as you on a lot of those things. But I do think it's better to when it comes to marriage, lifelong commitments, to be closer to what you said, 18, 20, then let's say nine. And this is an arbitrary number. Sure, it's arbitrary, arbitrary but we know things about humans. We know that that children are children and they can't, they don't have the life experience to make lifelong commitment decisions like this. Okay, you're just assuming. Just assuming again, is 14 year old good? Isn't number? that very reasonable that a kid kids are stupid and crazy and and irrational yeah, and is, emotional? And and this is why the parents give consent for that. Right? Well, then parents that gets back to my if the parents give consent and the child disagrees, then your answer should have been the child shuts up and does the what the parent does, says if the if the child disagrees, she can decline the marriage. It is, it is allowed. There is a divorce in Islam. Yeah, I would love to have seen that. I would love to see a nine-year-old back in the year 600 say to their mom and dad. Well, again, this is assumptions. Assumptions, just assuming, right? It's so not, year old. none of this bothers you? Like you don't have any ickiness? No, no, of course not. Why, why would I have any ickiness? It's, it's the Western thing. You know, you have to realize that putting, age, uh, putting a number to an age and consummation, this is pure liberalism, right? It's, it's a recent but thing. if I married your nine-year-old, if I married a nine-year-old, non-Muslim, has nothing to do with you, you wouldn't say 52-year-old marrying a nine-year-old? There's nothing in you uh, that would I, say... I wouldn't really care. I wouldn't you really wouldn't care. care. About but if someone were to say, hey, did you hear Pine Creek married a nine-year-old the other day? And you go, what? Yeah, it's true. What would your reaction be? Be honest. Would you say, oh, good for him? Or would you say, that's gross? I wouldn't care. And uh, this is completely okay because number on marriage is is a liberal. I find it hard. Right? I'm not a liberal. I find it hard to believe you. I think I'm not a liberal. I'm not a liberal. I, I think if you're not a liberal, you'd be even more so saying <laughs> that's gross. Conservatives tend to have more of a disgust reflex than liberals. You would say that's disgusting. A fifty Pine Creek is a disgusting old man marrying a nine year old. Oh. I think that's what you would say, right? You know what, what I would say about conservatism? Conservative, conservatives are pathetic, okay? They, they are so pathetic that they stand one step behind liberals. If a liberal takes one step forward towards degeneracy, the conservative well, takes those, one those step forward. Those are fighting forward, words. Those takes are... one step forward by uploading himself for being one step behind the liberal. When liberalism was pro-LGBT, conservatives was anti-LGBT. When liberalism moved to pro-LGBTQ plus minus zero, conservatism moves to pro-LGBT. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Are you pro-queer? Absolutely not. But the conservatives <laughs> are much worse than liberals, right? I, I respect actually liberals more than conservatives. Uh, but a lot of conservatives are not pro-queer, so they're like you. So why no, are no, you... Do you... Do you understand? They, they, they are the same. Conservatives are just... Uh, Liberals who are one step behind liberals. Right? I know, it. but I'm saying with the, on the queer issue in the United States, at least, most people who are anti-queer are they lean conservative. You're anti-queer, so why don't you uh, ally with them? Because they are hypocrites, right? It's, it's like with drugs. When when liberals legalized weed, tried to legalize weed, those people, conservatives, were against it. Now. Uh, and liberals try to legalize cocaine, heroin, and now conservatives say, okay, weed is okay, but cocaine, heroin, no, we can't do this. When they will legalize heroin and cocaine, right? Well, that's part of the social contract. That's just, it just takes time. Exactly, exactly. So they're just following liberals, but they're doing it slowly. They're just uh, lurking behind. But it's, it's the same. Conservatism is just... Uh, hypocritical liberals that's well yeah I, that's what makes that the word progressive is there for a reason like conservatives want to keep things the same and progressive want to change things they are both not progressive they are both but i would think a part of you would appreciate that like don't you believe or value the islamic traditions 
Islamic traditions have nothing to do with Western conservatism. Well, no, but it has to do with conservatism in general that you value tradition, you don't want things to change. You got this solid rock called the Quran, which is the basis, a foundation for morality and how to act. You got Sharia law that has rules set forth by Allah. And if you got these flag waving, phony uh, uh, progressives coming in and say, oh, no, these are outdated laws, these are outdated uh, ways of looking at the world, like I would think you'd be against progressives that would talk that way. Of course, but I'm against uh, conservatives too because they are the same. They just masquerade. They're chameleons. Okay, so you're you're just what are you then? I'm a Muslim. Of course, I'm on the Quran and Sunnah. And that's it. Conservatives, liberalism, communism. But Nazis, there's liberal. The there's liberal and conservative Muslims. No, there there are no such thing. There is no such thing. Ahmadiyas. Who? Ahmadiyya. Uh, Kadianis. Um, uh, yeah, I'm saying uh, it wrong. Ahmadiyya. Yeah, they, they are not Muslims. Those are equivalent to progressive Christians. Oh, no, they're not equivalent to progressive Christians. They're just deviants. They're like uh, Jehovah Witnesses or something, Mormons. Well, yeah, and a lot of people say progressive Christians are deviants. <laughs> a lot of conservative Christians. Well, 90% of all Muslims are Sunni Muslims. So yeah, we don't need to look at the minorities. <laughs> so as, as the conclusion, well, the conclusion just, just so you could understand, these are the correct answers. Why Allah had to create? Don't know. Mystery. Mystery. mystery there is a purpose we don't know it uh concerning age of marriage you can marry at any age consummation when there is no harm for health now this is the bottom line right this is the line this is the correct answer to, to both of this now what else do i need to clear up no that's it you cleared it up hey uh, one, okay. oh no one more thing uh why is russia losing to the ukraine uh, it's not losing they're just brainwashing you Oh. We, we are winning, right? It, it's just propaganda. But it's been a how long has it been? Why? We're why? Why to... is there still fighting? Why hasn't Ukraine fallen down to their knees and begged for a surrender? Because you, you guys pumping millions and giving them weapons, right? If, if they were winning, you wouldn't be spending. Well, so so much, what? Right? Russia's would... powerful. Why a few millions? And we are doing the, the casualties is one to fifteen, right? For one dead Russian, they lose like fifteen. Their yeah, it should be over by now. Ukrainians. They are, yeah, yeah, this is how it, that's how it goes. It's a grinder, right? They in a grinder. Yeah, I, I was right, Elias, a long time ago when I told you the, the state of Arizona could wipe Russia out. We don't even need the whole union. Well, twice Ukraine the pride, is double putting the up a huge fight. Twice the pride, double the fall. Hitler was also winning. Right? <laughs> first, first years of the war, he was right near Moscow, where I live, right? What happened then? Napoleon conquered Moscow. What happened to him then? Hmm? So, twice the pride. Double How old are you? Why aren't you fighting? I'm 30. I'm actually in the in the second wave of mobilization, but they say the second wave uh, won't be. I'm, I'm in the reserve. Oh, so, so there's a chance you will good. fight? Yeah, yeah, I'm in the second wave. Are you wave. worried about that? No, not at all. Uh, I'd be glad. Are you willing to, to die for your country? <laughs> not for my country. No, no, I just hate the West. I hate the West more than I love uh, Russia. Whoa. You well, you hate the West more than you love Russia. Yeah, absolutely. And Russia is just uh, it's, it's a very convenient battering ram against the West. You know? I, I'd have no problem sacrificing Russia if it will get rid of the West. Yeah. All right. Okay. Have a good day. Adios. Hey, Santa Claus is here. Do you have something to say? You're, there's a seven second delay, so you got to turn off the... Yeah, I hear you. Uh, Muslim in the background there, so I didn't realize anything. I thought we were just going by nicknames, you know. You're, you're going by Doug, I'll go by Chris Kringle in the spirit of Christmas, if that's okay with you. But yeah, That's fine. Are you a theist? Uh, I am. Okay. What, but, um, what flavor what of ice cream got... are you? What flavor of ice cream? I like to think of myself as a chocolate vanilla swirl. <laughs> are you? Uh... As a kid, I could never decide between chocolate or vanilla, so I had to decide that you know two was better than one. What religion so... are you? Um, I would be Christian. Protestant or Catholic, or Orthodox, or none of the above. <sighs> Um, that's an interesting question. 
What you don't know? I what? say that. I say no. I say I'm not sure. I um, I'm not sure on the category. Right. I like to. Do you go to right a church? Now. I do. I was uh, born and raised in even fundamental circles, so fundamentalist evangelical circles. I think it's all nonsense, um, especially in the rise uh -oh. of um, the man whose name rhymes with rump. <laughs> so, so not not the biggest, you know. Do I, supporter do of I all smell that a progressive Christian? Uh, well, I think that anybody who believes that the world is ten thousand years old is progressive, according to Ken Ham. So I'd say that uh, it depends on what you mean by progressive. <laughs> Okay, so you so you were raised evangelical fundamentalist, but now you think that a lot of that's baloney. Uh, so what do you believe? Can I ask you rapid fire questions? Uh, well, I actually, Doug, we actually know each other, man. This is why I'm calling. I got to go to the gym in a couple of minutes, but uh, usually I work at this time. But today I had off, so I just want to call in and just I was listening to your show and it was interesting. Um, we know each other. The guy was on, well, through email at least, yeah. If you consider that acquaintance. Well, who are you? How do I know you? I'm Santa. Okay. Do you, are you, do you have anything serious to say or are you just... I'm just messing around, Doug. Um, no. So what is it? So I talk, I wanted to know if actually if I could ask you a question. I was curious. Okay, go ahead. Um, so, Doug, did you say that you have like family who are identified as Christian to an extent? Oh, yeah. So I'm curious, like, what is your experience with that, right, outside of the show, like, engaging with other Christians? Like, how do you interact with believers who I guess you have a personal relationship with? I usually don't talk about religion at all. Does it ever come up? Like, does some of them watch your show? Um, if they do, they don't tell me. Do you ever tell them that you have a show or you just never bring that up? Never bring it up. I th well, my my immediate family all know I have a show, but my wife, sisters, parents, they don't ever talk about it with me. They, my wife did uh, the first year I left Christianity, but other than that, no, we don't talk about it. So, um, so there are people in your immediate family who are Christians or yeah, believers my of wife. some sort. Yeah. And does, does she ever ask you questions like pertaining to what you believe? She did the first year, first two years maybe, but now she doesn't ask me a thing. Huh, that's interesting. No, yeah, I was, I was just curious about that aspect. Because she already knows so. all the answers. Of what Your I, wife? She, yeah, she knows She knows what how I'll answer, so there's no need to talk about it anymore. Mm. And um, do you have like friends outside of your family who know that you have a show or who know your beliefs and talk to you about this kind of stuff again if they do uh like i have a golfing partner that i golf with every monday who is a conservative evangelical and if he does know i have a show he never brings it up so and i've never asked him if he knows because i don't want to lose him as a golfing partner <laughs> <laughs> i can understand that so would you say that you would approach people i guess in person differently than you would approach them online when it comes to these topics maybe um, a little bit, but not too much. Like I can't, like with the other Muslim guy, I had a, he talked so much. I had a, you know, turn his volume down once in a while. So I can't do that in real life. Right. But no, what I'm pretty much the same guy here as what you see, would see in real life. And if you don't believe me, you can ask some of my poker buddies. Like I, um, I might be a little more quiet, like, because when you have a show like this, you most people get uncomfortable with dead air, so I'm saying stuff. But yeah, I'm pretty much the same guy. What made you want to do a show like this? I'm curious. Uh, it's great fun. Uh, it allows me to talk to people. Um, I get a dopamine rush from making people doubt. And um, and I've, cre I've made a lot of really good relationships over the years because of this show. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm I'm curious. So someone like Thomas Merton is someone that I really look up to. He said once that if he was to define his beliefs according to beliefs that he didn't have, he'd hardly have anything left. So in other words, if he was to define what is Christian by denying everything that's Hindu or Buddhist or Islamic or whatever, then he could didn't even know what you know he actually believes, what could be called Christian at that point. So I'm curious for you. I mean, I'm assuming it's not just that you're against certain beliefs, that you're 
for certain beliefs. So, right, you're not just combating beliefs, but you're also presenting beliefs of your own. Like, what would be some that you would take away? I'm guessing something like, um, I know many conservatives are more so worried when it comes to uh, issues regarding race and gender. And I think you said at some point you're a little bit more conservative. So I'm, I'm curious, like, what would be some positive beliefs that you would want to present to people? Yeah, uh, some of my positive beliefs is I think um, what makes a better society is leaning towards personal responsibility. That's a big one. That's more political than religious. So you're talking more religious? Or if, um, I, I, I have a positive belief that the, the material is all that there is. So I'm a materialist. I'm a naturalist. That's a positive belief. Um, but that's like, so what? In day-to-day -day life, I think um, I'm, I believe in fairness. I believe, uh, I do believe a little bit in tradition in helping my kids have an identity of who they are so they're not easily blown back and forth by the waves of life. Is that, is that the sort of things you're looking for? No, oh, yeah, that's interesting. So um, I was thinking too, I think at one point in some video you talked about consequentialism and I've thought about this before is that oh, yeah, I'm a the Roman Catholic... Yeah, so the Roman Catholic Church accounts for about uh, 20, I think it's 25% of the world's charities. It's, it's kind of crazy. So I was thinking, do you think that if uh, there's some sort of militant atheism that became just uh, more and more active and tearing down institutional structure like, like the Roman Catholic Church, that that would um, leave vulnerable these charities and that these charities would basically go into demis? I mean, mm. for the sake of I'm going to go Hitchens them. on you on this one. I was going to ask you. Yeah. yeah, because I agree with Hitchens. I think if if uh, the Roman Catholic Church was abolished overnight, there'd be a little bit of transition time, but all those charities, the money that was given to them would be replaced by other people. And a lot of the downside of the Roman Catholic Church would be erased and not replaced. In other words, we can replace the good but I agree with Hitchens that some of the evils done are, are some of the greatest are done in the name of religion. Mm. Now, yeah, I was curious on the consequentials account because I thought about the question before. And although I'm not a Roman Catholic, I have to acknowledge it does worry me that I have, I very much doubt that if the Catholic Church was to crumble into dust, that people would pick up uh, where they left off as far as charity work goes. Yeah, there would be a lag time. That, you know? There would be, I think, some pain and suffering because the Catholic Church does create hospitals and schools. Uh, so I agree with you in a short time frame. But then people, I think, would see the need and rally, whether it's the government takes over or other, or the Protestants, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I'm also, I'm curious, right, about... This consequential route. So, for example, there are progressive Christians who, instead of uprooting Christianity or Islam altogether, they'll try to approach the text through a somewhat different approach. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I guess to something like same sex marriage, for example, right? They'll try to do a lot of scholarly work in order to convince people that it's compatible rather than say to toss out the religion. And some people see this as a good because I guess. Um, these people don't have to go through a crisis of identity uh, and just lose altogether who they are in their religion or tradition and their family that they found themselves in. So you as a, as a consequentialist, something like a progressive mm. um, scholarly Christian, would you be more open to that than saying we need to tear down it all altogether? That's an excellent question. One of the best questions I've been asked in a long time. Because what you're doing is you're pitting the two things I value against each other and you're causing cognitive dissonance in me. Because uh, I am a consequentialist, and, I, and yes, um, you're hurting a lot of people by just destroying religion immediately. But I also value truth speaking. <laughs> so I believe that a lot of progressive Christians who try to massage the Bible to say it's okay for gay marriage... I agree with the conservative Christians who say that's bogus. What what would make you say that? I'm curious. Oh, you, you could go the Old Testament, especially. Sure. You know the whole abomination thing. 
and I do, you can go to uh, examples in scripture. Now, you, it'd be hard to, mm -hmm. to say polygamy is wrong, but homosexual marriage, yeah. I think it's... it's. D Doug, have you read, like, New Testament scholarship? That, so for example, Doug, like... No. Um, okay, so <laughs> why I'm saying this is there are, there are... I know some people, when I talk to them, they just they just are antithetical to any sort of uh, institutional religion altogether that they'll just but, wipe but it away. But that's not the dishonesty right? part. The, see, what they're trying to do, what progressive Christians are trying to do is say is God's mm -hmm. behind this in some way. And He's behind what? The Bible and what it's saying. So mm -hmm. when you when a progressive Christian says, but if we read the text this way and uh, exegete it that way, you'll see clearly that the Bible has nothing against gay marriage. They're still trying to give some gravitas to the Bible and saying that, hey, it's okay for the sake of this consequentialism as, that you're talking about. Yeah, I, I see. see it, I think that's interesting because when I talk to progressive Christians, they don't use language like that of protecting the quote unquote the Bible because the Bible doesn't have a mouth. It doesn't say anything. It's the authors that do. So uh, like Randall Rouser is someone who I know. And he'll treat the Bible more so as um, God as his editor than his direct author. And so I've been uh, involved in uh, publication of certain works before where I'm involved in an editorial task. And as an editor, when I'm combining the text, I have a different intention than the original authors do. And sometimes they get mad, right? Because <laughs> right? the way that you put the text together, they'll say, that's not what I intended, right? So this is what happens. Um, so I'm curious, like, um, when you encountered progressive Christians, that maybe, like, me being raised as a fundamentalist evangelical, sometimes I guess. I thought it was either fundamentalism or nothing. And I, I was a little bit closed minded to the idea that there may be a different way of putting the puzzle pieces together. So have you ever been? Well, well definitely about you can that? massage. I, I do think you can massage the Bible to make it say almost anything you want. Um, yeah, see, that, I'm a little bit skeptical. I think we do that. Don't you think so, Doug? With a lot of things, we just don't want our beliefs to be defalsified. And so what we immediately do is we try to fit everything within our system. So, for example, there were people like Tycho Brahe, who they wanted to make sure that the Earth was at the center of the universe. So they invented epicycles or, you know, all the planets revolve around the sun, but they still, the sun revolves around the Earth. So don't you think that's just in human nature that we just don't want our beliefs falsified? Say that one more time. Do you, don't you think that's just in human nature that we just don't like having our beliefs falsified? Oh, yeah, definitely. It's not necessarily Christian. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, right, if that's true, if we just intuitively don't want our beliefs falsified, then we can no more blame the Christian, the Muslim than we can ourselves, right? Uh, blame them for what? So, so like an example that I think of, there are certain naturalists who believe that, um, that everything, uh, that everything is physical, but then there are others who say, well, perhaps the non-physical arises from the physical. So at the end of the day, everything comes from the physical, but perhaps it arises out of the physical. And some, I guess, um, some dualists will say that what they're doing is they're playing fast and loose with the data. Uh, I, whereas the naturalists me, will say that they're to me phrases like blame everything. and praise should be based on what people do, not what they believe. You don't think that people should be judged for what they believe at all? I lean no. So, like for example, do you think that like there's if, a freedom if it, from religion? For, if if it doesn't impact their actions, then no. Like I'm against thought crime. So, like, uh, let's say the Freedom of Religion Foundation, right, the president, uh, there's a guy who, he was a theist, and he wanted to be the president of the Religion from Freedom Foundation. How does that make any sense? What? Uh, say that again. Well, what are, so let's say that there's a theist, and he wants to be the president of the Freedom from Religion Foundation. Right. How does that make any sense for him to become that? I mean, wouldn't we be judging him for a belief that he holds? Well, we're not blaming or praising him. That's what I'm saying. You just if you have a what rule if, if you have a rule that says theists only or atheists only that's fine it's a rule but i'm talking about we should only blame people or praise people for what they do not what they think what do you mean by blame i mean like like in advertising there's pushes and pulls there's like ostracization and there's um uh stern looks and there's like awards and certificates and say and applause that type of thing so we shouldn't ostracize someone for their belief you're saying yeah like for example if someone's a kkk member and they believe black people are inferior to white people but they actually don't do anything bad in their actions we should not 
blame them or punish them for merely thinking it. Mm. Yeah, I guess that's yeah, interesting, Doug. Like I'm thinking about the word blame and ostracize because like, for example, I think it's the connotation that comes with the term ostracize because the theist, for example, who wants to be the president of the religion, uh, Freedom for Religion Foundation would be ostracized in the sense that he would be disallowed from being the president, right? Yeah. But if you mean ostracized in the sense of a harsher connotation, like yeah, that's what it's I mean. Not just a, yeah, okay, that's interesting. Um, really, so is it because of how the belief arises that you think we shouldn't judge people? Is that why we no, shouldn't no, no. judge people by no. To me, actions speak louder than words uh, or thoughts. You don't think that belief is a sort of action? Uh, not to the external world. Like if you, if you have a belief that's in your mind, in your brain, mm -hmm. and you don't act upon it, then what harm have you done? So what if we knew what people's beliefs were? Should we judge them then? Well, I think it's human instinct to have aversions to certain ideas. But oftentimes aversion to certain ideas is the idea could actually be true and we still have an aversion to it. Like the earth doesn't, uh, um, the sun doesn't, the earth doesn't revolve around the sun. Like that used mm -hmm. to be an idea. And when someone said, no, that the earth goes around the sun, someone goes, they have a huge aversion to that, right? Mm -hmm. It was actually true. Well, I, well, so Doug, I'm trying to think here. So let's say, like, do you have a daughter? I think you yeah, said you do I at do. some point, right? So like, if you had a fellow who, um, he, let's say that um, he seemed like a nice guy on the external, right? And he wanted to ask your daughter out. And then you found out that internally what he wanted to do uh, by asking your daughter out is he hoped that this would wind up in something and not just sleeping around, but, you know, something extreme, maybe some sort of perverted sexual act that you don't approve of i mean would you judge him for that you know thing that's cognitive in his mind like it's not external to him yeah i i definitely would judge him yeah i would have apprehension i'd have fear so you would judge him if you knew it if yeah. that that was his belief okay so how does that i'm trying to see how does that fit with your statement that we shouldn't judge people for what they believe i didn't say judge i said blame i mean praise. blame blame i'm sorry yeah. so should we blame him um no but we can still judge him. Okay. Why? Wait. So yeah, I'm. I'm curious. Like, so why is it we should not blame him? Because he actually hasn't acted upon it. Okay. Interesting. So you're against thought crime. Yeah, it's interesting. I have to think about that more. You ever read George Orwell's book, 1984? No, I don't read. You don't. You don't read. No. Uh, you ever watched the movie? No, I don't think I did. It's a. There's an old movie. There's one that came out actually in 1984. Maybe you've seen clips of um, it. Yeah, th there's one that came out in 1984 in honor of George Orwell, I think. That was the purpose behind it. Um, and it was actually a really interesting movie. I had to watch that like back in middle school. So that's interesting, Doug. I'll have to think about that. Yeah, more. it's. Uh, I do get your point, though. Like, it's human nature, I think, to have these revulsions or adulations like... Um, Oh, you're so and so. You believe this? Well, so do I. I like you now, right? When they actually haven't done anything, and mm -hmm. so in that sense, well, in that sense, I agree with you that yeah. that I I would have these aversions or or desires, but mm -hmm. when it comes to especially in society, when you're legally punishing or mm -hmm. legally rewarding, whatever that means, it's it has to be based on action, not on thoughts. See, I guess something that I was thinking of, Doug, like this whole time is I think that beliefs, don't they manifest themselves in actions, whether or not we know that they do? So, for example, someone who. Yes, has a really often bad, yes. Yeah. But often no. Oh, that's what I'm trying to think of is, uh, yeah, is so someone who is really racist in their beliefs. I'm trying to imagine how that doesn't manifest itself, even in micro actions or someone who has a horrible addiction to pornography. Like, yeah, just it's just. Like, how do those beliefs? I always give this example. Not manifest themselves. I always give this example about how many um, married men there are in the world who have thought about having sex with another woman <laughs> in a monogamous, closed relationship, and yet don't act upon it. Never. Their whole they go their whole life, mm -hmm. and they never act upon it. There's the difference between the thought crime and the actual action, and mm -hmm. most of us would agree that that. 
uh, it's we shouldn't blame them for having that thought, but we mm -hmm. should blame them, especially if there's a sort of a social contract between him, him and his wife not to do it when he does it. But Doug, don't you think maybe that thought? Let's let's go with that example. So there's a guy who he really lost after this other woman. Well, maybe what happens is it creates resentment inside of him for his wife. And that um, it creates him to become belligerent with him. And then later he divorces her and marries this other woman. I mean, couldn't that happen? Sure. Anything's possible in the magical kingdom. But, I'm, <laughs> I, but, I'm, but I, what I'm saying is there's tons of ex examples where it doesn't happen. No, I agree. I agree with you. Yeah, yeah. I agree with you. So, there, so, yeah, so we I, have okay. to distinguish between thoughts and actions. Mm -hmm. even, yeah, with, so even, the, even with racism. Thing. Like, I, I love this topic because... I love making people feel uncomfortable with it. Um, I ask, I often ask people, why is racism, racism bad? Mm. How would you answer that? Why is it bad? Well, I'd say that there's a, a number of factors. Um, so f I guess uh, one of the things that instantly comes to mind is that I think that people are of a certain value and that racism is violating intrinsic worth and intrinsic value. Um, I think that and if you want to say, well, it's just a belief, I guess it just depends how you're defining race. It's such a nebulous thing to nail okay, down. Okay, so let's say I believe, so, let's say I believe you uh, let, have less value than me. Mm -hmm. Why is that bad? Well, I guess it depends what you mean by value. You know, these things, so if you meant that I had, let's say that you meant I had more instrumental value as the president of the United States of America, if I was the president, well, that's not a lie. You're just admitting the blatant truth. But if you want to say at the end of the day, you have, I have more final value than you. So for example, I think of Doug, have you seen the, um, during the COVID pandemic, there was the former Supreme Court. Why is um, racism bad? Oh, I, I was giving you an example. I said racism is bad because number one, I think that it violates intrinsic uh, final human worth. And why is number that two, bad? I think that Darwinian, why is that bad? Yeah. Well, I'm a Christian, Doug. Uh, so I think that human beings are created in the image of God and that racism goes against um, God's okay. intentions of how so we deal with So you believe it's bad to devalue someone because um, creating the image of God and God basically said so. But, but, but here... I don't think he basically said so. Okay, forget God, I like, said that. Okay, but um, isn't it true that some people are worth less in value than others, even in God's eyes? Instrumentally... Uh, instrumentally well see it gets so no instrumentally yes i think that's true i think that in the final sense no so for example if um if it's called triage where if i'm a medic for example and uh, i go to a battlefield and there's a guy with a scab and a guy with a leg blown off i'm going to prioritize among those lives according to the damage done similarly i think we can see that with value in a society if you have for example a, um, an individual who he's very wealthy. This gets into consequentialism. He's very wealthy, right? And um, he's able to produce jobs on the vast scale versus you have a bunch of poor people who are getting in the way of that. The consequentialist might say, well, screw the poor people. This guy's able to bring more value to the society through the creation of jobs. So something that comes to mind is railroads, well, where they would railroad projects would go into private territory. And sometimes you'd have people who get screwed over by that, by the railroad companies. But the railroad companies were able to provide, connect the nation, provide many, many you're, jobs. You're talking so, a little bit too much for my liking. So, okay, what more do you want to know, Doug? I got to go in a few minutes, but... Um, like, if you can, so just yes. keep your I'd answers yes. like 30 seconds. So, I, I'd say mo that most people, yeah. when I ask them the question, why is racism bad? Most people answer, because it hurts people. Well, but, you know, me getting a cavity and the doctor working on me hurts me. Right. Yeah. So why is racism like, bad? bad? From a secular point of view, how would you answer that question? Like, I know, because we're all creating God's Sure, image. it goes against well-being, I'd say, for the individual. Okay, how does being a racist go against well-being? Um, I think because it, um, it's an individual denigrating me, right? And I guess you could say, if you want to go back to the whole dot. Because uh, it makes people crime, feel bad? Well, see, the thing is, Doug, I think that racism leads to action. I think that racism... Okay, let's say, let's say yeah. I'm a racist and it leads to action, but I, I view other people as inferior as a race to my race, and it leads me to help them. It leads you to help your fellow like white man? No. 
other races oh. other than my, my own because I feel sorry for them because they're inferior to me. Wait, say, say one more time because you caught me off guard with the last part. What if I was to tell you I was a racist, mm -hmm. but I use my racism in a good way to help those who are inferior to my race? Is Now here's my question. Is racism bad? I mean, so is the race is that are inferior to you the ones that you're being racist against? Yeah. So, okay, so what would be an example of that? Okay, so let's say um, I provide scholarships for people of a different race than me to go to university because I feel sorry for them. Okay, you're talking about like affirmative action, something like that. Yeah. Yeah, no, this is what I'm saying, Doug. I think it's an interesting question, like, uh, you do well, what's the question? The question is, like is that form of racism bad? I um, honestly think they're inferior to me in this thought experiment, but I'm using that belief mm -hmm. in an action to create scholarships for people of a different race than me. Mm -hmm. I'd say that the intent behind it can be screwed up. The action itself is good. So the action can be good with the motivation behind it being bad. Well, okay, but right? what's more what, important to you? Like, well, this is similar to the question, Doug, where people, they want to get a tax break, and so they donate to a certain charity, so they don't have to pay less on taxes. I think their action, it benefits, of course, the people who benefit from the charity, so what's, but they're still trying to get a tax Would you break. rather me be um, a non-racist that doesn't help uh, people? Well, you know what I'd, I'd rather would, right. would be to pull so, out of the So, so here's, a, right. here's a great example of consequence sequentialism of actions mm -hmm. being better than thoughts someone can have um, a thought that a race is inferior to them but it can lead to great consequences mm -hmm. no yeah I, i'll tell you doug like um when it comes to consequentialism um so i'm a big history buff and so being a history buff is hard not to be a consequentialist <laughs> um so one that comes up often was hiroshima so I'm curious uh, for you. So there was an article that was written once. It was titled, uh, Thank God for the Atom Bomb. And uh, the individual wanted to present an argument to the extent that if American Allied powers had invaded Japan, it would have led to the death of over a million Japanese civilians and over 100,000, 200,000 Allied soldiers, and the economy would have been devastated. And so in reality, for consequentialist reasons, the atom bomb was like a godsend. So what do you think about something like that? Uh, that's a tough one because we can't see the future. Like the, the question really is when the decision had to be made, they had a way deaths, um, saved versus deaths taken. So I don't know is my answer. So do you think that the scale matters in terms of consequentialist, uh, standards? Yeah. I think the scale of human persons involved. Yeah. It's often phrased as net suffering or net benefit. So, so how much is too much, do you think, for you? When, do you, when, like, when does it start to make you queasy? You got to give me a specific example. Um, so Hiroshima is like the biggest one I could think of. Um, I think the railroad uh, analogy is one where you have this railroad company trying to well, one could even, jobs. One could even point to um, Nazism, uh, World War II. Well, that's too big. I think, so Doug, what would you say with the railroad one where you had, I can't remember the term for it. I know, I know there's a specific legal term for it where uh, the railroad company, when they're trying to chart um, You really got to get they... better at making your questions short and succinct because I've been going for like three hours now. I know, and I, ha I have to get out of here in a second to go to work. So I'm curious. So, Doug, would you, would you think it's wrong if a railroad company screws over a family by building their railroad <laughs> through the family's property, right? Do you think that's a right thing or a bad thing? Bad thing. And forcing them to leave? Bad thing. It's a it's a bad thing. Why is it a bad thing if it creates jobs for a whole lot more people? Because um, it's a value system. You put placing um, the value of private property versus the value of um, communal property, right? So in general, if I do, you're basically talking about, what do you call that term? I can't remember it. Uh, when the government can take private citizens yeah. property what's that nick called that's what you're talking about uh, no it is i can't remember the term though i was trying to think of it past couple minutes yeah i think in some cir circumstances um it can be good 
but these are like these are really tough judgment calls. Yeah, so I was curious because we were talking about scaling, and so on that scale, we only have a few people getting screwed over, and we have you know dozens, maybe even more dozens of people with jobs now because of them getting screwed over, and they still get to be positioned somewhere else. It's not like they have no money now; they just got bought out. But you would still think that's wrong. Yeah, I would I lean that way because of my value of uh, respecting private property. So if there's any other way to get around it, like to build a railroad around it, which one could argue would, you know, provide more jobs because they got just more work to be done to go around. So, but I, I, all these questions you're asking are sort of like, they're similar to moral dilemma questions, which are really tough to answer. And a lot of them oh, yeah. I would say, you know, I don't even know all the facts, all the variables. So I would just answer, I don't know. It's a tough one. But I do. I, uh, yeah, I was curious. But I do. Um, I will be honest with you and let you know that there's certain things I value more than other things. And private property is, is one I value greatly. Over, no, yeah, over, so, over the right or over the opportunity to, for more people to get jobs. Okay. So, so, yeah. Okay. Let's put this. Eminent domain. Thanks, this. Charles B. Yeah. Let me this. Uh, I got to go on a second. Doug, but let me change this analogy one more time. Let's say there's these people getting jobs. If they didn't get these jobs, it's highly likely that they and their families will die, right? They need the money so they can provide for their own families. And so if the railroad doing this is able to give if these individuals like, jobs, would you change your mind? Yes. Uh, and why is that now? Because they're going to die if we don't. Okay. So, all right. I was curious. I would ask you more questions, though, but I know you got to go and I got to go. And, yeah. um, thank you. Before so you go, do you believe Jesus Christ rose from the dead in bodily form? Um, Trans physical form, yes. Okay. You're not a Christian. Have a good day. Oh, that's N.T. right, man. <laughs> He's a flag-waving phony. How long have I been going? I said three hours. Yeah, three hours, 22 minutes. Oh, it's you again. I remember you. you got to wait for him to catch up. Look at him type. Let's see when he figures it out. Look at those eyes. <laughs> He's smiling. He has like uh very are those blue? Hey, you you're here now? Yeah. Okay. Hey, you helped me make a great short and a great clip the other oh, last time you were on. That's fine. I sent it to my atheist friends, and they just got a little bit closer to Christianity because you were being mean. Mean? I was mean. Yeah, to you? you're, you're the you're the official atheist troll of the internet. Oh my <laughs> goodness! What would I? What did I do? Look, look at what look I at do? your YouTube Favicon. It's basically a troll. Well, no, it's a nice. It's okay. It's a nice uh, char cartoon character. That is absolutely a troll face. Somebody trolled you by giving that to you. <laughs> well, I thank them. In fact, if they're here, let me know if it was you. Because I think it was very well done. I think it, it looks good. Yeah. It's cool. It has First Kings 18 on it and everything. I don't even know what that is. Is that the one? No, that's an Ezekiel, the one about the donkey you penis. You call yourself oh, a Christian. Don't you don't know First, eight, first Kings 18. You call yourself a Christian. Nah, I'm a Second Temple Jewish guy, so I focus more on that. Well, that's than even worse. The Old Testament. First Kings 18 is in the Old Testament. You Second Temple Jewish guy. Okay, what do you want to say? Well, I <laughs> I was commenting on something completely. Uh, what were you guys arguing about concerning? Um, was it consequentialism and thought crimes? Yeah. That I. Why, why did that even come up? I don't know. This guy came on and then. I think he it, has. A, don't, don't let him come out again. That was bad. I think he has a philosophy bent, and so I want to talk philosophy. Actually, uh, the first part of it, when he was asking me questions, I found his questions very interesting, so I kind of liked it. But then I started getting tired because he just kept talking and talking. Yeah, he talked too much. Yeah, I, I, I wasn't listening to him. I was just sitting in the comments. So don't make that mistake, I, right, guy. Don't keep your questions and your answers short and sweet, okay? Yeah, well, I just wanted to say, I think what was interesting is the, I don't know, I kind of hopped in in the middle of the moral 
thought crime thing. But I think what's interesting is some people in the comments were sharing, you know, Jesus says if you lust. think uh, or lust in your in your mind or have murder in your heart, you know, you've you've already committed adultery. Yeah. I think what's interesting is there, I would like to point out, that's not actually, Jesus is not actually talking about thought crimes there. He's using a common practice called building a fence around the law, where the idea is, hey, let's create like a super conservative rule so that we don't even get close to transgressing a commandment or the Torah. And so different Jewish sages would create these really conservative views. And he's not saying if you actually think of a woman in your head, you've actually it's equivalent to God as like Nobody sleeping say with a that. woman. That's, re- that's not what he means by it. Uh, he's the using- good old, that's what it says, but that's not what it means argument. Yeah, he because he's a Jew from 2,000 years ago, not a Western American from Kansas. <laughs> so it's pretty like, actually, we should expect it to, to be somewhat clouded because they're Eastern thinkers. Westernism has completely shaped how we think, <sighs> our education system, everything. Do you hate your country? Just how it is. <laughs> Me? <laughs> Sorry, we'll say, no. we'll say that for the politics channel. Oh, politics channel. Yeah. Are are you all right? Let's be honest. Let's put the cards on the table. Am I? All, what does that mean? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know either. <laughs> like it, it means different for. It's like I'm a Christian. Well, what does that mean? Am I? A Keep it on politics. Am I lose people? The people they're scared of politics. So what? What do you you want? Oh. You want to talk about God or you want to lead me to Christ? What do you want to do here? No, that's not going to happen. It could. <laughs> not really. If you light up my water-soaked napkin, it will. Might. Maybe. Probably. It'll definitely destroy yeah. my worldview. I, I actually, uh, I think you, I don't know if you were you were responding to Caleb Jackson, because I Caleb and I are friends, and uh, he's the miracles guy. You've talked to him before, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know who Caleb is. Yep. He loves me. <laughs> is that you being sarcastic? No. I'm serious. He really likes me. Yeah. Oh, I can't tell, honestly, because you're you're absolute mega troll. So I can't tell if you're giving me like a sheer straight shooter right it's, now or. It's my sense of humor. No, I get it. You, you've been you've been redditized. So I mean, what Reddit? I, oh, Reddit. Like Reddit, you know, Reddit humor. It's definitely Reddit. humor. I've probably spent a total of 30 minutes of my entire life on Reddit. Well, you're the OG then. You're an OG Reddit troll i'm just teasing i'm just teasing call me troll one more um, time we'll see what happens <laughs> yeah you can you can boot me um okay i think say i think you make a good point no i think you make a good point where you're like christians like again god isn't necessarily a genie but you're like hey i, I want to see a miracle and i think what's interesting if christians are listening i know i, I grew up pentecostal so i'm more inclined you're, to that but i think that your, your input your mic has gone all bad Damn it. Yeah. I'm tired of this audio problems. Aren't you guys tired of it? Maybe I should just not take guests anymore. Like they usually very rarely say anything good. Anyhow. (laughs) Yeah, Travis, I know you made a Reddit Pine Creek. Troll lives matter. If you refresh, it will help. Fry guy. That's why using video is bad. It uses up data. I've talked to many people who use video and they have no problem. It's these theists. They can't afford their internet bill. And, um... To get this cheap internet. Like, like, there we go. Yeah. Safari. You got five. Don't, you got don't. five minutes before it comes back. Okay. So say something really important that you want to say to me. Well, I just I, I think I think your challenge of hey I want to see a miracle again. Sometimes the miracles are a little bit like start my napkin on fire. Okay. But I think to some extent your challenge for Christians is a legitimate challenge. And I, I don't think that Christians should be like, hey, if God exists, I let's agree. ask let's ask for something. Let's petition something. Let's ask for a prayer. Let's have some chutzpah and actually like, hey, God, 
Jesus commanded Yahweh in the Gospels, heal this person. Their genitive commands in the Greek. And I think, let's be a little bit so more bold you and, came on and, to and tell, see if something happens. You came on to tell other Christians that what Doug is well, asking for is not bad. Well, to kind of validate. Yeah, not, not necessarily. I mean, if you're going to ask someone to light a napkin on fire, that's a very different thing saying, hey, I want someone to be healed, right? Those are very qualitatively different. But I, the I don't latter think so. option— Depending on the healing, I don't think so. I think the napkin's better. Like if someone prays— Because it's more random? No, no, because so much of the healings can be— Like uh, pray for my uh, brother-in-law who has stage 4 terminal cancer— but he's taking chemo or whatever he's doing these things and we do know cancer can go in remission maybe not stage four but anyhow but breaking the laws of physics like that to me is way more impressive than um medical healings gotcha unless it's like an amputee getting his limb back yeah or like raising <laughs> the dead yeah re yeah reversing it's so hard yeah, I think what's really hard though is like, is it isn't it technically possible that somebody's raised from the dead, but I don't know, but it's not actually a miracle. Like they were sure it could be an happened. alien or whatever. But if if someone's going to say in the name of Jesus, and then two seconds later someone rises from the dead who's been dead for three years, you got my attention. What about someone who's paralyzed? Uh. That one's a little tougher, too, because we do know people fake paralysis, right? Yeah, fake paralysis. Okay. What if, what if, like, you knew this person, they're not faking, right? Oh, then, like, yeah. I think okay. a yeah, lot yeah, of yeah. miracle stories, like if my sister, uh, she was paralyzed, if someone prayed in the name of Jesus and she got up and started running around, my whole life would be changed. Mm hmm. Interesting. Your sister's paralyzed? She was. She's dead now. Oh, rest in peace. Well, yeah, I I don't know. I think, and also to, to sort of, you know, if atheists are listening, I think that sometimes these challenges, like it's can be almost of a tribalistic battle back and forth. But I guess I'm here to say to some extent, you know, if you look at the Old Testament or even Jesus or the apostles, you know, you see Elijah and he commands fire to come down and it comes down. I don't know if that story actually happened as as the way it did, but the the story that the, the themes that we see is that God acts. So, I think God feels hidden to a lot of people because either He doesn't exist do you, or God seems hidden to a lot of people because He is hidden if He's real, right? Yes, I, I would say God is necessarily transcendent um, because you know Isaiah, God's ways are high are high above our ways as. You know, but do you believe God's personal? Are high above the heavens, are above the earth. I don't know. Um, I'm sure that's actually something I'm unsure about. You know, Tyler Vela deconverted, right, yeah. because of classical theism. No, the thing of me. is, though, because of you. Yeah. Wow, you scored a point. <laughs> Go, you're in the World Cup. Um, he's on this tour <laughs> charade telling people it's because of classical theism or, or that it was so good and that it made the Bible look bad when really, you know, Tyler and I know the truth. That's, that's fair. The problem I have is again, second temple Jewish guy. And if you're a Christian, the name Christ, I kind of have to submit to Jesus. Like at the end of the day, if Jesus is like wrong about something if he's off base, doesn't the whole thing kind of fall apart? Kind of like if yeah. the papacy falls apart, Catholicism isn't true. If Jesus falls apart, well, I might as well just become like a Jew, like a full on, like non messianic Jew but, or something. But aren't like you that. that already, really? No. Well, yeah, I would say that I'm a Gentile Christian, and Christianity, the early form you of don't believe Jewish Jesus movement. really rose from the dead, Bali, right? Well, hold on. Yes, I do. I think that still Jewish views of res Jewish views of resurrection are strictly physical, and anyone who says otherwise is not does has I'm not read Jewish literature from the Jesus. Period. They're unfamiliar. Do you believe Jesus was God in flesh, died, rose again on the third day? God rose <laughs> ro rose again. Yes, bodily. Because yeah, bodily. So the God thing. Really? That's you believe tough that for still? me. Yeah. Why? Based off the Gospels, their testimony, and also you the... You wouldn't believe anything similar 
based on if it was in a different book? <laughs> um, right. You've heard my flying man. Yeah, I've heard the flying man. The problem is the flying man is a false analogy. Oh, don't give me that. I can make it to whatever you want it to be. Then, then I'll concede it. Okay. Then I'll believe in the flying okay, man. But, the, but, but you don't, though. You don't the, have the thing is, though, it's a thought experiment. So I'll concede what, it. What okay, don't I have? experiment ends. Where's the evidence of it? No evidence. Oh, you Don't need, deal. You need move things on. on paper, right? That makes all the difference. Yep. And I also need history and a sequence of events that are causally connected to each other. Like the, tr the movement of the early church didn't just like pop out of nowhere. It's causally connected to all these things. Oh, of that course. Seems There's movements in to go every religion. And you don't believe they're fundamentally true. Um, you know that's right. No, not necessarily. The thing there's is, there's growth. There's movements. There, yeah. And you don't believe. That's like you're describing a business, though. I mean, it's kind of like a properly basic thing you're describing. It's like, yeah, there's growth in a business. There's decline in the business. Yeah, all those are religion. I mean, to think a man rose from the dead. You know. That. Um. I, well, I, that, that's I the thing is, though, than, that's just part of it. I talk to you differently so, than other people because I know you can handle that, and and you're so that's fine. You're, I'm not. you're so close to leaving Christianity. No. <laughs> yeah. No, well, are. the problem is, I've had I've had very veridical experiences personally, and you know, like, oh, you could go to a concert. The problem is, I haven't experienced that. I haven't. I've gone to cool concerts and I've had feelings of euphoria, but they're they're distinct and different ah, from spiritual. So let's talk about that because this is probably the real reason. Give me your best veretical experience of God. Um, sure. Or did uh, have we talked about this already? A little bit, but you know, so I I actually got kicked out of my church for for political issues and. <laughs> oh really? Uh, people are gonna call me an insult or something. Comments. Yeah, I'm a troublemaker, you know, I try to stand up for justice and truth, you know, you know, obey the gospels, like that good stuff, you know, the stuff that you probably would like, even if you don't believe in God, like the stuff that's like, oh, you know what, I want that, that behavior to be encouraged. Um, yeah, Experience no longer a part of, of a church. Experience yep, of God. And I, I definitely had trauma. And that I, the trauma that I had from that experience was connected to a church environment. So when I, when I would actually go back to a church, like two years later, I took a break from church, didn't go for two years. Um, I had a hard time interacting with worship. I was like, ah, I just want to sit in the foyer. Like, yeah, this I don't is... know. I don't want to be in there, you know, very skeptical. Didn't want to be around people. And you felt a but... warm, fuzzy feeling going from your mm -hmm. belly to your head, right? Yeah. Just like the toilet after Mexican food. No. <laughs> <laughs> Am I close? Uh, no, 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 no. I, I actually had a, a euphoric feeling because there's also some other stuff in my life, some personal issues, some failings that I've had in my life, some moral failings that I've been very shameful I, about. I don't want to know the backstory. Had a, had I just a, want to know what happened to you that made you – what did you feel? Parable, parable the prodigal son, and in a moment of silence and reflecting on a historical artistic depiction that the, the pastor showed on screen of the son and the father just – giving absolute grace to this son that had but what did you done horrible things sense of complete overwhelming forgiveness love peace um, so it was a cognitive uh cognitive and emotional obviously cognitive because i'm i'm intellectually engaging okay. with what i'm so seeing and hearing let me get right this straight you are feeling bad you go to an into a church you hear this message and then you feel good. Um, yeah, that's a definitely a very high level gloss of the situation. <laughs> I wouldn't say that if I go to a TED talk and I felt good, the types of good are the same. Now you, like a really good TED talk as right. a tear jerker, not the same though. Right. Like I just haven't had the sense of euphoria from a sick TED talk. But right guy, right guy, from a spiritual experience. you're smart enough to know the outsider test for faith. You're smart enough to realize that there's these types of experiences happen in a lot of religions that I think you deem are false. Yeah, but I think that spiritual... So this is a great question for you. I'm going to turn this back on you for a second. Do you think if there were no spiritual experiences ever, like literally we knew objectively spiritual experiences never happened, would that be evidence? Let's just say everyone in all existence said 
for a fact, we all truthful, we've never ever had a spiritual experience. Would that be evidence against theism or for theism? It's against, I'll just let you know. Okay. It's against theism. Epistemically, that would be if we had no spiritual experiences across all human history. Experience, though, are you talking about things like setting people, uh, water soaked napkins on fire and raising the dead? Or are you just talking about the way no, you like had? The, this, the way I had, right? Like in a spiritual setting connected to a religion, no, no one ever had. That would be evidence against theism or for theism? I would say it would be a, it would be, it'd be neither. It'd be evidence right. for psychology and for. Um, but given theism, wouldn't you expect spiritual experiences to exist? Given, given if theism were true, given theism, yes, uh, on the hypothesis. Yes, I'll, okay, I'll so grant you that. Given theism, okay, so it it, it can be used as evidence yes, for, but it's very okay. terrible evidence because it can be so easily uh, misconstrued, faked. Uh, it could be well. Easily... I guess I've been. I get. Well, I guess if I can doubt my spiritual experiences, then I'm going to start to doubt scientific experiences. Um, oh, no, testimonies no, no, of no. scientists. And now my epistemic reduction. You're in you trouble just, now, you right, come... guy. You are in Why trouble. Not? Why not? Because if you start saying, oh, if I doubt what I experienced in church when hearing a good message and that feeling I had, then I might as well doubt that when I let go of this screwdriver is going to fall. I'm going to start doubting that type of stuff. Are you seriously going to yeah, go there? Yeah. Well, What's the difference between sensory experience and euphoric experiences in the mind? I'll it's tell you. I tell, I'll mind, tell you though. the difference. It's but one of bias. So it's just bias. No, no. But you're not. Listen to me. When you walked into that's that, that's kind of weak. When you walked into that church, <laughs> where were you? You were in a church. Now, if I walk into that church. I'm going to have a completely different take on it because I don't have these preconceived ideas in my head. Oh, a God exists. Given that a God exists, he's, I would expect spiritual experiences. I'm feeling sad. And this pastor happens to preach on a message that makes me not feel sad. You, you, know, you know what I've been praying for? I actually today on my way to work, this randomly pops in my head, but Alex O'Connor has been like, I am just open. If God really exists, like, come on. I've actually been praying that he has a euphoric spiritual experience that he can't explain. Yeah, it might work so, on him because he's a little touchy, more touchy feely than me. But, <laughs> um, but here's the difference: the difference is you can have different biases, different cultures, people from different areas of the world. In in the hard sciences, they can all agree of what they're seeing, like pens falling, balls balls bouncing. They can see this. But when you're now talking about these internal spiritual experiences, whatever that means, and and the attribution of them, it is heavily dependent on the setting you're in, the country you're from, the culture you're raised in, the religion you're you're most around. That alone, if you agree with I what with what I just said, you ought to doubt your spiritual experiences. No, because I think you made an error. The first error you made is, well, I'm seeing the ball drop outside. The problem is you're trying to make sensory experiences somehow substantially different from other sense, other types of sensory experiences we have. The difference is other cultures, other biases agree with what they're, what they're seeing. We can actually make machines to record and verify. If a ball bounces on a table, we can actually even measure the force that it hits oh, the table. So those are with. all extensions of our sensory Yes, experience. I know. A microscope. I know. So it all I'm boils a, back down I to agree, my eyes, though. I agree. I agree. It's all based in eventually in the sensory. But my point is when people of different cultures and different biases are converging to the same conclusion, which you don't see in religion, then you say, I should have more confidence in the scientific stuff than I do in the religious stuff. Well, spiritual experiences are ubiquitous across time and culture. But they come up with conflicting attributions and conclusions doesn't it happen in the sciences though too it can Our but, scientists but nowhere to the well, near well there we go no not where you go it is not even near to the same extent <laughs> no matter if you're a jew a <laughs> christian a, a muslim a, a, a atheist we all agree that at sea level something will fall to the acceleration of gravity of 9.8 meters per second squared there's no dispute on this but mm -hmm. when we talk about religious experiences, 
Is well, it, now there's oh, no is it a trinity or is God one? Is it are we all God? I mean, it's nonsense. Is how all over the map it is. But I think I think what you're doing is you're there is some certainty in science. There's a lot of uncertainty in science though too. So you can't ignore that, right? So there well, there's I'm uncertainty in theology. That. We don't have well there. There's clearly some disagreement in the scientific community. Yes, it, there is. But do you so can you repeat that back to me what, what I just you're said saying? in your own words? Because we know some things that are shared probably at a 90%. I mean, I, I don't know. Most people probably believe now that gravity is negative 9.8 meters per second squared. But somehow that undercuts the idea that spiritual experiences are not as veridical. Somehow, or connected I told you to how. Epistemog epistemological belief. I told you how it undercuts it. Because of agreement and consensus? You're getting Isn't closer. That... What was the main okay, factor? Keep going, because that's a fallacy. What's the main factor I said that makes it why it's scientific? We should put more confidence in that than versus spiritual experiences. I said because of different. So Conclusions, different biases, biases, different cultures. It doesn't matter what you are. And that happens in science, though. Science isn't like a perfect monolithic thing. It isn't. There's m more than one scientific hypothesis or scientific method. There's like seven scientific methods that you can utilize. They're all great. They're all veritical and they help us come to the truth. I don't know why, but I don't I feel, know why you're being so stubborn. I feel like well, because I think in some of these conversations, science becomes almost like a demigod of some kind. And it's like, whoa, hold on. There's disagreement in science. And if you ignore that, I feel like that's kind of just either begging the question or think, that's a bias at play think, for you. I think you know exactly what I'm saying. And I think you actually agree with it. I don't. Let's just, don't. Let's just, take, let's just take something as simple as throwing a ball in the air and having it come back to earth and land. Do you agree... That whether I, you're, I, I, do, whether you're, I will not doubt. I don't do doubt I that sensory experience. I don't doubt it. I'll be myself. Do you agree that no matter if you're a Muslim, a Jew, a Hindu, a Buddhist, an atheist, a Christian, that we all agree on planet Earth, if a boy throws a ball in the air, it's going to, we can see it go up and it will fall back down to the Earth at 9.8 meters per second squared. Do you agree with that? At some point, at some point in their life cycle, given the ability to see All or you have feel, to do is say yes, yes, yeah, you do agree. Well, with that. it's important. Now, given yes, it, given that we, there's different biases, we all can con converge on the same answer: nine point eight meters per second squared. The ball will come back down, right? We all agreed on that at sea level. Let's say you know it, it changes roughly depending, but. So now, now take religious experiences of athe oh well, not of atheists, but of Christians, Muslims, Jews, Hindus, and Buddhists. Now let's take spiritual experiences. Do you think we're all going to converge on anything close to a number of agreement? Yes or no? On what this God is like, who this God is, let alone coming up with a, a, a number? No. No. Thank you. I just, I just don't think that does anything to undercut what I'm saying, though. It does I think it's a non to undercut it because how we figure out what is true, one of the main things to figure out whether if something's true or not is to lower our biases and our preconceived ideas and our preconceived conclusions, right? Do you agree with that? Well, yeah, to some extent, right? Epistemology, philosophy science scientific method can help us uncover right. and get rid of biases the scientific Absolutely. method one of its greatest strengths is it it basically controls for that bias not that it's i agree with you it creeps in and there's tons of trouble in science but what i'm saying is it is a billion times better than spiritual experiences that we can come to conclusions that oh the creator of the universe did speak to me in that sermon that i heard in the in that in that church no, I'm saying that you ought to doubt that spiritual experience. I would even go further and say that you are foolish to think that you should have high confidence that that was anything to do with a God. Well, hold on. Well, we didn't talk about the type of confidence levels. I don't think, 
I don't think at the point I'm in now, maybe when I was younger and I didn't have as access to different defeaters, like if I was a 12 year old who didn't have access to arguments for atheism, I could have rational belief in God on the basis of a spiritual experience. That case, I'm not at that point anymore. I've learned things. I'm older. I'm more mature. And so I'm aware of different defeaters for God or the existence okay, of God. Okay, where's your confidence so spiritual, on that spiritual experience you relayed to me that before? I'd say my my spiritual experiences have been consistent and they appear to be reliably formed. What's your confidence on the level basis that it actually has something to do with medium, God? Medium, medium level. Medium. When I hear medium, I'm, not thinking, high. I'm, I'm thinking 50% when I hear medium. Roughly. Uh, yeah, yeah, like, yeah, that's pretty decent. Like in a poker bet of 50-50 okay, win, that's decent already if I can increase <laughs> it even more. So now let's relate this back to where we started. Why do you believe a man rose from the dead? We talked about the historical, but then you kind of shifted to the experiences, and now you're 50-50 on it. Well, I'm just that alone is a 50-50. No, right? but one of the Addition main reasons the you equation. believe Jesus Christ rose from the dead, one of the main reasons, these spiritual vertical experiences, you're 50-50 yes. on. Well, that, that's part of it, but I also think the Gospels and the story they tell is reliable for the most part. For the most part. There's some issues in there. Okay. Yes. Uh, and I think that when you look at church history, the best explanation of the church starting it is that the apostles really did believe Jesus bodily rose from the dead because it's a Jewish belief. Again, these Jews were not Gnostic. People don't understand Palestinian Judaism. Um, okay, let me ask you this, because you mentioned the history yep. thing, and I, I, I kind of love the history thing. If all you had was Paul's letters, the what is it? Uh, there's 13 letters, but only seven of them, scholars say, are his. If, if that's all you had, would you believe Jesus Christ rose from the dead? No. What if we add the first gospel in of Mark? Would you believe Jesus Christ rose from the dead? That's not the first gospel in my view. Luke is. But if I had Luke, oh, yeah, yes. We talked about this. If it was Luke, yeah. would you believe? Uh, yeah. But nothing mean, Luke, else. Luke has so much freaking information. Luke's the best gospel, hands down. Okay. So if you had Paul's letters and Luke's, you would believe a man rose from the dead. But not just, yeah. but not just uh, Paul's. Well, look Acts because it's one codex. But yeah, I need Acts as well because oh. Acts is very important to that. Okay, so you need Acts in addition to. Okay, what about Luke Acts puts you over the edge to believe it? Uh, it's this one. Well, I'm not going to go into the the reliability, but one, the story it tells and how it connects to the early church movement. So, if a different religion uh, has books and it has a story to tell and it connects it to a religion, you, that you automatically increase your confidence that that religion is true. Uh, it would increase it, yeah. It would, it would increase the confidence in that, and then then we get into a sub debate of what is the best religion to go with. Because so the many gods, have, religion... the many gods objection, many gods objection. Okay, well then we just instead of like talking about which. General theism, okay, Christian theism, what about this religion? Well, many gods, let's start to look at each of them within reason and start to disqualify some as being less probably true. Every religion has stories to tell and connects it to their religion. Are they the same as the Gospels? No. Is, are, is the well, Gospel same as them? No. No. Are the Gospels better in my view? Yeah. Why? Because <laughs> the quality... And storytelling that's going on Be specific greco-roman autobiography the life and ministry of jesus and the causal okay the life and the mini best causal explanation of the possible doing what they did the life and ministry, is the, the life and ministry of jesus you said in the roman biography type style uh tell me this do we have more evidence for the life and ministry of jesus or ravi zacharias uh, Ravi Zacharias, but Jesus Correct. is still the most attested Jew in antiquity. Okay, so if the evidence we have for Ravi Zacharias is better than the evidence we have for Jesus, and we were wrong about Ravi's character, could you be wrong about Jesus's character? I could be wrong, but unless I'm presented with a defeater or some sort of evidence, I have no reason to doubt that right now. Do you have reason? I was presented. Were you presented with evidence that made you doubt right. Ravi's character? Yes. Yes. Therefore, you doubt his okay, character. Let me present some go. evidence to you that makes you make you doubt Jesus' character. Where to start? Um, if a person, if Jesus says, "I am God," 
when you see me, actually, he doesn't say it in Luke, but let's say he hints towards it that he's he's God. Would that make you think that he, his character is one of oh of God or more like a lunatic? Well, again, I'm not necessarily certain that Jesus overtly teaches he's a deity in the Gospels. I'm, I tend to land there, but I, I, I think you can concede that and still be a rational Christian and believe in Christian theism. Okay, so you don't believe he's God, <laughs> um, or necessarily believe he's God. Okay, what? If, mm -hmm, not necessarily. What if in Luke it talks about Jesus walking on water? Okay, do you you read okay. you read that story? Do you think Jesus actually walked on water because a book says so? Um, I think those types of miracles I trust less than the resurrection for sure because I think why there's. Well, actually, I'm wrong about that. I don't know. That's a good question. There's, I think there's something about the resurrection and what happened directly after that sort of narrative. And then we know that something happened, right? Because the church exists. Okay, um, can, let's get back and to that explanation that's given. Do you believe Jesus? Well, hold on. That explanation there of like the resurrection supposedly happening and then the church starting, that's like additional evidence for the resurrection because the resurrection was the causal starting the engine looking, of the church we're talking about the text. What is walking on water we're do? talking about the historical text the historical narrative sure. not what happened after the historical narrative when you read the historical narrative well, that Jesus that's sort on of water, weird do you believe it um yeah i i think because i'm a christian theist i think that i believe it you do believe it mm -hmm. okay throughout history in your life, how many people do you know can walk on water? Uh, none. None. That I've seen. Do you know any? Do you, do base, you know anybody? You know, analysis do you know anybody who knows someone who's walked on water? No. So your baseline, your own personal experience, would say that walking on water doesn't really happen in history. In my personal experience, right? Sorry, you're kind of well, okay. Yeah, you're shifting. Pre you're going from like premise, small claim premise, small claim premise, big premise. No, I mean, no. I'm basically saying your background knowledge in life, because you're a product of the in life. There we go. Yeah, your background knowledge in life is that people don't walk on water. So, yeah. so what about it in Luke's Luke and Acts overcomes that for you? It says Jesus walked on water. I think it says in Luke. I already said that. I think there's less trust in that miracle compared with resurrection. But you still believe it, you said. I I would hold it less true than the resurrection. But you said you still believe like, it. Do you believe it yeah, or not? Yeah, but it, less confidence. Okay, but you yes. still believe it, right? Yep. Why? Because I'm a Christian theist. So like miracles and things like um, that you are You realize that's a horrible answer, right? Because... Because Christianity, because you don't like it. That's no, why. No, it's, that's why it's a bad answer. Okay, ask me why. Credulity is not an argument. No, it's because if you're giving a historical narrative defense of why um, you believe Jesus rose from the dead, and we go into the details of it, and I ask you a historical claim, a question about a historical claim, and why you believe it, and you say because I'm a Christian, you you could have said stuff like. Well, because it's attested three different times in three different Gospels. That would have been a good answer. And then I would have asked the follow-up question, well, what if they're just born from each other's stories? How did you eliminate that option? Well, the Greek is different. Yeah. The, uh, Matthew probably used Mark and Luke. But Mark it, might have used Luke, but it's hard to demonstrate that because the Greek is different. They might have been working off of the same source. Right, right. So and, I guess your point still stands. Yeah, and so when you answer, well, I believe it because I'm a Christian, basically you're just saying, well, because it fits in my worldview. Well, fine. But I could just sense, say that, well, people not walking on water fits in my worldview. Now what do we do? Well, first, you can't jump to that, right? Like my – like domino one isn't walk on water. There's a lot of stuff that needs to get built up to even order to have any trust in something like that. You have to, is God even exist? Theism? Then you have to get to Christian theism. Then you have to kind of understand why Christian theism is true. So miracles become increasingly more likely for me and my worldview compared to yours. Because we're 
coming from different methodological we have no, different tools I, I in would, my worldview that you don't have i could grant you a god exists i could grant you um that even the christian god exists and still say all right let's, con let's go and, and still, still and still say the sinner's say prayer to you rye guy well we're saying the sinner's prayer right now hold on you just submitted god a christian god exists and i could still say that it's still unlikely that that passage in luke or in the gospels of jesus walking water is false that he didn't walk on water so you i can give you that a god exists and it, from your background knowledge because this god still exists today in your view right jesus is still real today in your view and yet we don't see those types of miracles around so our background knowledge says this does not happen and if it does it's very very rare and so we need something to in order to believe it we need a ton of evidence of normal evidence mm -hmm. at least to say that it did happen and that the other expl explanations are, are not sufficient like it's just a story to maybe show that he has power over the weather or over physics mm -hmm. yeah the hasidim were had control of the weather which were, was the movement that Jesus belonged to. But so. you know, I, I got to run because my, my wife and uh, son just got home. And um, and they've told me they don't like you. Okay. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> I bought them Christmas gifts. Because, you know, Jesus exists and BTW Christianity is true. <laughs> Anyhow. I, I'm not a Catholic, by the way. We should have talked about Catholicism. That would have been some, get some of the capturing Christianity that nonsense over here they had to, they had to moder they had to mo moderate the group because there's too much catholic debate going on oh, really yeah are I you in that. are you in that group yeah yeah i'm going to be going on a video here to debate swan soana not oh, not swan debate him but debate his argument swami does that guy no oh. joshua no swan soana is a he's a catholic so he probably honestly i, I i'm my my guess is you probably had, haven't interacted much with like the Catholic YouTube community. Okay. Am I wrong about that? Uh, um, yeah, uh, definitely more Protestants. Yeah. Did you see the yeah, video that, I made of, other... of uh, Caption Christianity and Mr. Deity? No. Okay. Was it funny? Oh, yeah. In fact, I'll let you go now and I'll, I'll play it on my live stream. You can watch it. It's only 60 seconds okay. long. 30 seconds long. Thanks for hopping on. All right. Yeah, if you guys missed this one, uh, so Mr. Deity is an atheist. He's a now a Catholic, and uh, he made a parody of this guy, and I put him together, and he replied, he loved it. I, I want to make, make you aware, aware of a couple, couple things regarding, regarding the operation operations of the Mr. Deity channel. Deity channel. Second, uh, I need, I to, make need to make you aware of the aware financial of the fact situation. That we've, we've been operating, operating at loss each month, month which is, is simply not sustainable. If this continues, we will be forced to shut down operations in six months. So no, no more ridicule, no, no more debates, mockery, no more conferences. No more contempt. It's all go away. Having, Having said all that, that I do not believe, that this, believe this, is this is the end of the channel. We need it now more than ever. I want to make you aware of it. We need it more than ever. Whenever you hear that, you grab your wallet and you hang on tight. We're too easy with dollar signs, yeah. Oh, is there an echo? No echo. Yeah, sounds like CNN. I love this clip even more than I love my Jesus. <laughs> Cosmic, Cosmic skeptic is so cringe? Really? I don't find him cringe, except when he talks about veganism. Thanks, so say we all. Yeah, we had some interesting conversations today. A couple Muslims, a couple Christians. Oh, 
Uh, Zeleny asks, uh, stop the music. I've never actually done this before, but I, I should maybe give you guys my thoughts on um, how I handle comments in my on my channel. So Zeleny asks, uh, why are you deleting, hiding, disagreement comments? Um, these are things I look for when I'm moderating my own channel. If someone writes paragraphs upon paragraphs of stuff, to me that's like coming into my home and just dropping encyclopedias all over my house. So I, not always, but oftentimes I delete it. If someone puts in links, YouTube usually pulls it out. So if, if you write a whole bunch of stuff and then put a link in it, odds are you're not going to see it. YouTube does that, not me. Sometimes it stays. I don't know how it necessarily works. Like their algorithms, I think, treat people with no subscribers differently than people with a lot of social credit on YouTube. So I don't know if that's true or not. If you disagree with me, that's fine. I usually don't delete it, but if you make accusations like you're a liar and you don't back it up, gone. If you say even things like, um, uh, you are very confused here and you don't give any specifics, usually I don't delete it or anything, but I'll ask, uh, be specific, give an example. And if you don't, just know that in my head, if I recognize your name again, I don't give you any time of day. I mean, I don't really care. If you misquote me in the YouTube comments, you actually use quotes, and then I check the transcript, and if it's not exactly what I said, you're probably going to be deleted. Because to me, I actually, when it comes to literary things like that, if you use quotes, you better have it nailed. And it, I mean, sometimes, you know, there's a little wiggle room because it's either inaudible or whatever. But that's the same as me saying something I didn't say, right? What else are my internal rules that I've made public? If I've deleted you before, blocked you before, and you come back as a new name, and I'm pretty convinced it's the same person, you're on very thin ice. Uh, there has to be other things I look for. But people who are articulate, specific, and concise, there's, in fact, there's probably people here who can attest to this, where they've disagreed with me, said I'm wrong, and I've said, you're right, I went back and watched this, I was wrong, thank you. Anyhow, I think that's about it. But you guys know me, right? You know that if you actually want me to pay attention to what you have to say, you have to get to the point really quickly. Because I got a ton of comments to go through, uh, and I'm not going to waste my time. In a way, it actually brings me joy when people are so stupid en enough to think that if they spend, I don't know how many minutes on a comment and I delete it, like it, it teaches them a valuable lesson. I'm a stranger to you. Most people on the internet are strangers to you. And if you are so egotistical to think that someone is going to read a long comment that you spend minutes and minutes typing out, you deserve to have it deleted and all that time wasted. <laughs> I know it sounds harsh, but it's a good life lesson. Brevity is the soul of wit. Amen. Oh, and I must also say that if it's a conversation between other two people, but not me, then I'm a little more lax about how long it is. But if it's like Two Pine Creek, blah, it's like... No, Zeleni, listen to me carefully. This is my channel. 
not yours. I can do whatever I want with it and suffer the consequences. You have zero power here. This is not a democracy. This is a full-fledged dictatorship. And I'm under the dictator of YouTube, of course. But I view my channel as my home. You are a guest. And I can kick you out at any time for any reason. I can kick you out for just having a bad beard. Although I like beards. Just not on me, because they're itchy. Bring the mustache back. Yeah, I should. Thanks for hanging out, guys. Take care.